the economy is just not as interest rate sensitive today as it has been in the past. When the Federal Reserve says 50 basis points, the market's saying unlikely. It's going to take a while for a central bank that has avoided raising interest rates to gain the credibility of the market. Monetary tightening will trigger recessions in a number of different countries. I think a soft landing is very difficult. The bond market is just screaming that tougher times lie ahead. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. A Friday into the weekend, into the third quarter of this year, and into a full-length three-hour recession chat. We're on the recession watch today. John Farrell on assignment, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Vacation. Keen uh, with you. Wow, have things changed in 24 hours? Recession signals abound. This has been a massive narrative shift, and we saw it slowly and then all at once, and that was what this week really marked. We saw initially the sense of resilience that markets could keep rallying despite all the rate hikes from around the world. <clears throat> Suddenly, a reset, people expecting the central banks around the world to create pain that's going to mean a downturn. For those of you on radio, I hear by call it guess the recession Friday because that's clearly what we're seeing we see it on the on the, the screen we've got a great set of guests to start your weekend conversation Adam Posen will join us later Richard Haas will join us later and we're going to start strong with Greg Bottle BMP Paribas here uh, in a moment Lisa let's just go through the tea leaves out there can we start with oil well under $70 a barrel, $68.75. It says, guess the recession. Well, and we've been playing that game with the yield curve, which also is the most inverted in the U.S., or nearly so. Going back to 1981, the German yield curve, the most inverted right now, going back to 1992. Wow. Looking at all of these signals of recession that have been there, people were just able to ignore them and say, AI, AI, AI. And now suddenly people are saying, maybe that's a little over its skis. And even that can't save us from central banks that are determined to raise rates beyond what people expected. The VIX yesterday confounded everyone. It's like a day to have Dean Kernan on for three hours. We'll try to work on that for Monday, Tuesday of next week. Yesterday, the VIX gave us a no volatility bull market, 12.73. I don't know what to make of it. Well, Morgan Stanley analysts wrote a whole piece on this, talking about how there have been distortions <laughs> in some of these main indicators of volatility due to some of the positioning out there. Does this mean there is less volatility, or does this mean it's being expressed in other places that are kind of coming to the fore? Again, people aren't gloomy. It's just the narrative has shifted to no landing to a landing. I think the publishing this weekend is going to be fascinating to see how people reset off Switzerland moving, Norway moving. The shock of the United Kingdom yesterday and on. Let's do this. Let's do a data check. Get right to it. At least it's got a brief uh, in seconds. Futures are giving me a little bit of a negative feel here on a soggy week. To say the least, still, S&P 500 futures right now, 4403. I feel like they should be a lower statistic, but they're not. The VIX, 13.36. Two-year yield, 4.76%. Uh, I mentioned oil. Brent crude, 73.50. Can you imagine a $69 Brent crude price, what would that mean uh, for Riyadh? In the currency space, slightly stronger dollar off the weakness of two days. Euro 110 print now 108.63. And just to sort of lean into the euro story for a minute, we did get those disappointing PMIs overnight. And just to sort of put this into perspective, European equities have seen their longest streak of losses going back to December. Global stocks just saw their biggest weekly uh, loss going back three months. We are seeing a shift that's not just central bankers talking about further rate hikes. We're going to have to see. I mean, it's as simple as that. I like uh, Abramo out on Twitter with an important quote. This from Torsten Slock. The only way to get inflation down at 2% is crush demand. Well, the concern... That sounds like it's very Bramo. <laughs> well, it's the consumer. Let's crush demand this Whither weekend. the consumer will get some more discussion <clears throat> from those Fed officials that have been crushing the potential optimism of a no-landing. Fed speak includes Atlanta Fed's uh, Rafael Bostic at 7.30 a.m. He's a dove, a. right? He has been dovish. He has mm -hmm. been saying, let's hold rates where they are, and they will inflict more pain as the year goes on. 7.30 a.m. will be that speech. 1.40 p.m., Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester perhaps taking a more tempered approach 9.45 a.m., this is really going to be potentially the key data point, especially after what we got in Europe. U.S. S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMI for June. It was pretty ugly over in Europe, particularly in France, where now people are projecting some sort of recession because services PMIs are rolling over, and this is not what people want to see. This, to me, is one of the <clears throat> key moments uh, to watch in the U.S. And today and tomorrow on the political front, the Republican Faith and Freedom Coalition Conference kicks off in Washington. 
Washington, D.C. I, I missed this event, please. And then we get a sense of all of the <clears throat> different 2024 presidential aspirational presidents, the former President Donald Trump among them, will be at the uh, event. We hear ex-Vice uh, President Mike Pence, awkward, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, Asa Hutchinson, U.S. Senator Tim Scott, Chris Christie, and Ron DeSantis are among those. Guy, uh, for those of you on radio missing the pageantry here, it looks like Hollywood Squares. <laughs> oh God, I mean, it feels I mean, that way, too. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking for Nipsey Russell to run uh, here at, at any point. Let us get started now, and we're going to really focus on the debate and the conversation over guess the recession. We've been wrong for 18 months on a recession as a collective society, and it, it's really front and center here on Friday. Joining us, Greg Bottle, U.S. Head of Equity Derivative Strategy, BNP Paribas, with some serious computer science study at Liverpool long ago in far away. You a bull or a bear in this milieu? I'm, I'm a bear. We've been a, a bear for the market all year. <clears throat> we think that these kind of recessionary um, headwinds are going to catch up with us. Um, but really, it's been positioning that's been the driver for the markets um, over the last four to six weeks. And we see some signs of that exuberance in the market starting to fade. What, why, why is there a bid on stocks? I mean, it's just as simple as this. There's a camp out there like you. You're really worried about left tail risk. You're hedging the optimistic right tail uh, risk. Great. You've been wrong. Why is the market going up? Yeah, the, the view that there is potentially going to be a recession has been the consensus call, and you can really see it reflected in positioning. I think one of the clearest indicators is looking at the CFTC data, where you can track the futures positioning, and you can see that by um, client type or investor type. The levered funds, which is essentially hedge funds, have a short position you know, greater than $150 billion. It's about three and a half standard deviations above the five-year mean. So the pain trade for markets has been higher. And we really saw that when the market broke through 4,200. We really saw this morph into a kind of an exuberant squeeze higher. And that's been coupled not just by a short squeeze, but also by people coming back into the market in a more speculative manner. You look, can th see things like some of the retail sentiment indicators, AAII bull indicator and it's very much tracking the cool volumes that we have also seen explode. It feels like when you come home to one of your family members and they've been in a pretty good mood and then all of a sudden you just feel the pall of a bad mood so kind of setting in. something you'd like to discuss here, Greg? Hold on. Just, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Just let me... Friday therapy with Bramble. No, it Is feels it... like that a little bit walking in today with the markets. There's sort of a pall of a bad mood that seems to have settled in. It wasn't just one day, two days. This is something that's going to be longer lasting. Do you believe that, that this has legs, or do you think that this is going to be something that's shorter? A face. I, I think the medium-term view is that we get the recession, and that can drive a deeper drawdown. Um, I think in terms of the next uh, week, I think we have some large technical selling flow that's coming up into month-end and quarter-end, and that could see this move that we've seen this week accelerate into next week. If that is to continue into the next month, then I think it really comes back to the fundamentals. So one, monetary policy, what the Fed are going to do in July, and two, earnings season that also kicks off around the same time, mid-July. Is the sell-off going to be concentrated, in your view, in the consumer discretionaries at a time when Janet Yellen is saying that there needs to be a slowdown <clears throat> in consumer spending to really effectuate some sort of uh, decline in inflation? Or do you think that it's going to be in the high flyers, in the tech stocks that have led the, right, the way up? So I think we might have different layers of what is driving the sell-off. I think if what we're talking about is the potential for the Fed to hike at the next meeting, tightening liquidity, then I think what you can have is a reversal of some of the high flyers and some of the more egregiously valued stocks. Ultimately, you know, the narrative this morning is more about a slowdown. If we do have a recession later this year, then I think it morphs into a much broader based sell off. This feels like a slow moving freight train, right? Because right now we haven't shifted to Armageddon. We haven't shifted to, oh my goodness, it's going to be a deep recession. We've shifted to three to five percent pullback. At least that's Michael Hartnett over at Bank of America. Maybe a bit of a reset. Maybe wait for buy the dip. Is that the kind of feel that you get as well? In the very short term, yes. So I spoke about the month end and quarter end selling flows. When we see that type of flow, it tends to manifest in a shallow sell off. You know, what the options market is certainly implying is not that we are going to get some kind of ferocious moves in the short term. I think ultimately, if we get a recession, though, in Q3, that's a move that could be uh, much more violent and much deeper. Away from your derivative abilities. Is there any optimism that corporations can adapt to a widely anticipated recession? 
I think so. I think that obviously the secular theme of AI has been much talked about. At the moment, it's a very narrow CapEx driven theme, but that's a tailwind for the market. I also think when we just look at corporate earnings revisions, the story in the back end or the second half of last year was one of quite a large downgrade cycle. The last uh, quarterly uh, reporting season that we saw actually saw some of the small, smaller downgrades that we've seen for a while. So I think people will be looking to mid-July to see what the outlook is from corporates, whether we are going to see a more stable uh, environment in terms of forecast revisions, or whether some of the softness that we've seen in the PMI data will manifest itself in more downgrades. I, I just find this fascinating, Lisa. It, it, it seems like Monday was ages ago. I mean, we, it's been a, it's, I it's, it's Grego, but it's been a, it's been an absolutely unique week. And you raised a really good question, <clears throat> which is companies have been adapting and adjusting. They have been. So, how much is we are we really going to see some surprise when this is the most telegraphed recession in the history of the world? And suddenly, the change this week to me, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, seems like people are resetting their expectations for how high inflation could stay. <clears throat> and how high central bankers are willing to go and able to go with the resiliency of the economy. Do you think that that is a game changer? And that was sort of the tipping point, the threshold that was tipped uh, this week. I think potentially the view from our economics team has always been that the policymakers, you know, the, the Fed in the U.S. are going to have to hike until they can find slack in the labor market. Slack in the labor market ultimately means unemployment going up, and that is what's going to trigger a recession. Um, I think what's important for stocks is even if corporates are you know, well positioned for this, and it's been a well telegraphed recession, when we look at valuations, it's not obvious that the market is well positioned. What's your target on SPX? Uh, 3,400. 3,400. Yeah, so we have one of the lower targets in the street, and really this is predicated on the idea of this right. recession actually materializing. Are, are you on speaking terms with Carl Riccadani, your chief uh, U.S. economist? Yeah, just Does about. Does like calling so, recession? Yeah, so, right. so Carl is looking for a shallow recession to manifest in Q3. So it's a slowdown in terms of real growth, but also inflation coming down. So it's quite a rapid so slowdown. So it's a nominal GDP growth. store. This is important, yeah. folks. Nominal GDP comes in because both real growth and inflation come down. And then that gets you to an earnings statistic, which gives you... 3,400? Yeah, so what that drives really <clears throat> is a top line slowdown, but then margin pressure that compounds that. So this kind of rapid drawdown in the bottom line against elevated valuations is what gets us there. I have to say, what this call screams to me is earnings of NVIDIA, <laughs> earnings of Microsoft, earnings of Meta that somehow disappoint and create that. This screams to me that Bramo booked Bottle. That's what it screams to me. <laughs> no. Why don't you toss? Where's Pharaoh to save me? Toss another question to Greg. <laughs> well, the, the, I'm, is, I'm is, drowning in the gloom. <laughs> quickly, is that really what you're <laughs> counting on? It's a trigger to get all the way down to 3,400. You need to sell off in the big tech names. Is it going to be earnings? To, to get to 3,400, what you can't have is the type of rotation that we've seen this year. What you need is a more correlated sell-off. So absolutely, if we get a recession, we think the cyclicals are going to lead on the way down. But what we also think is that you get broader participation in that sell-off. And we think that larger cap tech, it is defensive. They have quality balance sheets, but it is still cyclical. Some of those tech names are very exposed to the consumer. Some are exposed to the CapEx cycle. So if we see softness in the consumer, softness in the CapEx cycle, we think that translates to large cap tech down in absolute terms. Greg Bottle, thank you so much for getting us started today. So the BNP Paribas with Carl Riccadon, and I, I, I just got an email, and yes, Bottle and Rick Adonner in speaking terms. <laughs> well, good. It's good to good know. To know. <laughs> That's you not know, true at most firms. I will say that there <clears throat> is a shift. You can feel it. It was in the ether. We walked in. It was just sort of hanging over the office. Something had changed, and people weren't saying FOMO and you know everything <clears throat> is just going to breathe upward forever and and a, and, uh, and a day. Switzerland, Norway, United Kingdom, and buried in it was the idiosyncratic realities of Turkey. Well-timed. I think the, the finance minister of Turkey waits for Damien, Damien Sassar to come on before he puts out headlines. Turkey, moments ago, News you need to out know. with headlines here after a horrific 48 hours for the currency. Round it up, we're nearing 26 lira. It's not for me to say crisis in Turkey, but it is true. Things are unraveling. Turkey Simsex is process conducted gradually. Stay with us. It's a most interesting Friday. Adam Posen later. We have to get inflation back to target. You know, we have to have price stability. 
and we've raised interest rates to do that. The economy has been more resilient, it's been stronger, we've seen, seen we've got very low unemployment, but it is leaving us with inflation looking much more persistent. We think inflation is going to come down markedly this year, but there are signs of it being more persistent. And I thought it was right that we took this action. The governor of the Bank of England decidedly not declaring victory uh, yesterday. The British press is on fire this morning over, the, over this 50 basis point uh, lift in interest rates, very different real estate dynamics over there. What it will mean for a broad swath of the United Kingdom uh, public, really front and center within the within the, the media. Did you morning. hear Andrew Bailey's comments <clears throat> about what his recommendation was, the prescription for bringing down inflation? It was workers <coughs> ask for fewer raises. And by the way, companies, maybe don't try to expand your profit margins. We don't have the time here to do this because Sassauer is going to, you know, he's like work from beach this morning. So we got to keep this short. But we're going to dive into this this morning, folks. Basically, Bailey saying stuff that just could not be said in Washington, that, that this is because of irresponsible weight. I mean, I'm going to translate it. Irresponsible wage increases has led to inflation. That thud you heard was the entire macroeconomic community of the United States falling off their chair. And it was also the thud <clears throat> of people getting ready to protest over in England. I mean, honestly, we heard this from Hugh Pill and it didn't go over well. It was sort of the let them eat cake moment of Britain. And so how much do we get some similar type of response to Andrew I, Bailey versus, you know what, <clears throat> he's right, he's just speaking truth. I mean, at a certain point, you can't say, you right. know, inflation's going up. Maybe if you just took a little more pain, you'd be okay. We'll dive into this this morning. Stay where this is. You get to your weekend reading and try to dive into July of 2023. Uh, Damien Sassauer is diving into 2025, trying to look ahead, particularly at emerging markets. He's our chief emerging markets credit strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Damien. I have to talk about the Turkish experiment. It's unraveling. Is it a Steve Hankey, Johns Hopkins unraveling of hyperbolic depreciation? Or is there some measured unraveling to it as Semsec tries to right the ship? You know, Tom, I got to be honest with you. I'm actually quite um, inspired by the move uh, on the CBRT yesterday. I mean, look, 650 basis points is a big move, you know. And for those out there who thought it was all going to happen at once, good luck. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be stage. So we're going to get 650 now. We may get 650 next month and may, may get even more the month after that. But eventually, with 44 percent year-over-year inflation in Turkey, we still have a ways to go. And so what's interesting is you rightly point out we're almost at a 26 handle on, on dollar lira. Um, I think Goldman, HSBC, and the rest were calling for a range of 24 to 25. I mean, we're already there. I think Morgan Stanley was the only one at the upper end at 28, calling for 28 <clears throat> by year end. I mean, yeah. we're close to it. So, you know, how much further does Dollar Try have to go right. remains to be seen, but there are strategists out there, Phoenix, Kalen, and Sachin, for one, who believe now is the time to buy. Uh, Damien Sassar, in your world, there are usually two debt systems to a troubled EM frontier economy, uh, country, and that is a domestic system and the salvation of a foreign system of debt, usually wrapped around uh, dollars. Is that system broken for Ankara? Well, I, I mean, certainly, I mean, the difference between bank lending and deposit rates is massive, and banks can't survive <laughs> with, with that discrepancy for much longer. I'm talking Ock Bank, Apicredi, Guarantee Bank. And so, yeah, I mean, but here's the thing. We talk about de-dollarization. There's voluntary and non-voluntary de-dollarization going on globally, Tom. In Turkey, it's what I like to call voluntary. You have households in Turkey that are hiding out in dollar deposits at Turkish banks, as a way of sort of protecting their wealth or what's left of it after, you know, the policies of Erdogan over the better part of the last few years, that's not changing anytime soon. The conditioning is still there. People are not really um, believing what's going on with Mehmet Semsek and, and, and the new central bank governor. But nevertheless, you know, it is a step in the right in the right direction. And I'm, I'm, I'm relati relatively uh, inspired by it. Wait, hold on a second. Inspiration it means something and buying means something else. Do you see opportunity here for Turkish Lira? Or are you just saying it's nice that they did this? Pat, pat, pat. <laughs> Still avoid that like the plague. Well, I liked it better when uh, CDS, Turkish sovereign CDS with the 700, we're now back to 513, Lisa. So we've come all the way roaring back. So no, I don't like valuations here. I still think there's going to be some pain ahead. And look, when you, when you want to talk about pain, look at where cross-asset volatility has been. Look at what we're going. It's summer seasonals, weak liquidity. Um, you know, it's that shift in the beta regime from inflation concerns to growth concerns. 
this is messy time. So anyone who's calling for new highs in the S&P, yeah, we may get it, but it's going to be on light liquidity and I wouldn't trust it. So, you know, I, I'd be I'd be sitting on my hands here, quite frankly. A lot of people talk about how this market or any market likes to inflict the maximum pain on the maximum number of investors. The trade for the first half of the year partly was to go into the emerging world and find assets. You could see that with respect to all regions out there. Is that going to reverse because we are suddenly seeing perhaps Perhaps a uh, decline in the number of rate hikes, even rate cuts in some of the developing world, while the EU, even the U.S., continue to double down on hiking uh, those benchmark rates. Lisa, yesterday at 731 Lex, our New York headquarters, we hosted our Emerging Market Annual Investment <coughs> Forum. I asked that Shameless exact question plug. to people far smarter than I, including Diana Mo of Kirkuswald, and she said, as expected, it's all about the Fed. <laughs> and so let's be clear, we've seen Norway, we've seen Canada, we've seen, you know, the UK, sure. But all central banks are shrinking their balance sheets and liquidity is getting tight. And at what point does inflation kind of roll over or not? You, me and Tom are not going to figure that out here on today's call. But I think, you know, the reality is that is the pain trade in markets is that inflation does not go away. There are going to be more rate cuts. I mean, five and a quarter in Fed funds, my God, you know, we never thought we'd be here. And here we are. And now markets are looking for six. So you know, it, it remains to be seen, but all of that is certainly not good for risk assets and certainly not good for emerging market writ large. Damien, you said it's all about the Fed. Earlier this week, last week, we were talking to Peter Scheer about how the market is moving past the Fed and looking more at fundamentals and other drivers. Did that change this week? Perhaps it was for you know a week or two weeks or three weeks where the Fed faded into the background. But if we shifted back into very much the Fed as the dominant player, given the fact that they could potentially raise rates further than many people ever expected. Lisa, fundamentals don't matter. No, I'm kidding. I mean, look, they do. Um, but, but really, I mean, you can't trade on fundamentals, certainly not in currencies and rates, because, you know, it just takes... It could take decades for valuations to really manifest in, in, in those markets. So, you know, you really can't trade value in those markets, but you can trade ca carry. And carry matters. Rate differentials matter. So you want to shift? Let's talk about China. China's a funding currency now. It's got, a, it's got an inverted forward strip. I mean, people are funding in yuan and taking risk in places like Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, all of which, Lisa, are overvalued at levels we haven't seen in years and years and years. And that's just not me talking. That's some of... Some, some of the people on my panel yesterday were far smarter than I. So, you know, look, we're in this environment where vol has come off, the carry trade is raging, it's working, and until it doesn't work, I think people are going to press that bet. Damien Sassar, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it this morning. Uh, Damien Sassar worked from home after working from City Field last night. <laughs> I think so. <clears throat> did did that. you go? Uh, I did not go. I could, I could I see you there somehow. Yeah. I could see you there. <laughs> Doug, down in Florida... Notes that the dead played Alabama getaway last night at City Field, so I should have been there. That's my fave of all time. Were you a deadhead? I was not a deadhead, but when I heard Alabama getaway, it just jumped out at me. It was exquisite. It was there's just some craft there that's scary, uh, scary good. There's also craft to Anthony Dwyer at Canaccord Genuity publishing moments ago. He agrees with Greg Bottle. He's really got a cautious view <clears throat> on where we're heading, and he just says all that we see here right now is is, is becoming more likely. He says there's recessive tendencies becoming more likely. One thing we we kind of uh, <clears throat> glossed over here is the incredible dollar strength today. And yeah. it's a reversal of what we've seen for the past few weeks with uh, some of the biggest gains or the biggest strengthening in the dollar versus some of the peers, like the euro going back to March. I mean, this is really a significant move at a time when people are pricing in the Fed and looking at weakness <clears throat> elsewhere. This, to me, is the game changer. Again, the market likes to inflict right. the maximum pain on the maximum number of It's people. also where we are in the calendar. And I think it's important we're coming up on the year end, everybody, uh, mid, mid year rather, everybody has to justify their existence. We're beginning to see economic studies come out. I know J.P. Morgan's been out in the last 48 hours as well. <clears throat> but what I would focus on is what Greg Baudel said, is this is all predicated on earnings cracking into the earnings reports, which you mentioned, I believe, is July 14. That's J.P. Morgan kicking and, off. And, you know, once again, it's very traditional financial study, which is you got to wait for earnings and see, see where they are. Uh, it's an extraordinary day. Richard Haas scheduled to be with us as well with the Council of Foreign Relations. Coming up, Dr. Piegza from Stiefel. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everyone. Jonathan Fair on assignment, Lisa uh, Abramowitz and Tom Keener on a Friday to get you to the weekend with some good Friday reading and thinking about where we are. As we said earlier, without question, the tide has turned in 48 hours, at least internationally, to a guess the recession tone. As Greg Bottle stated from BNB Paribas, Lisa, we've been doing this for a while. It's the reason okay. why perhaps people shrugged it off <clears throat> and perhaps people started to realize maybe it's not going to come. There is over this resiliency. Over a year? I think over a year. And that's the reason why a lot of people didn't believe it, that it was actually going to come anymore. And then central bankers yeah. said, we have more work to do, yeah. and it's too much resilience. Bruce Kasman and out with the J.P. Morgan Love Fest and to distill many, many pages, the pandemic promoted resiliency. I think it's a brilliant paragraph by the J.P. Morgan team sort of navel-gazing and saying, okay, what did we get wrong? And a medical event gave us the shock, along with Biden's stimulus, of a far more resilient ecosystem than anybody expected. One of the most unprecedented aspects <clears throat> was the rolling recession type of narrative. This idea that one sector could suffer pain and another could experience mm -hmm. incredible strength. And then it flips, which is the reason why I'm looking for the PMI data that comes out today at 9.45 a.m. in the U.S. Do we start to see the right. services sector, the main point of strength, <clears throat> loosen up the way that we did over in Europe? Now, we're going to do this internationally today. Yes, Kasman, on a global J.P. Morgan economy, but there's a domestic feel as well we're going to address right now. But we're going to keep our eye on all the international turmoil, particularly the European turmoil. And you really wonder what China does Sunday, morning, uh, Sunday evening. Our time. Yeah, and we've had uh, the straight weekly <clears throat> loss that is the biggest for global stocks, at least, going back three months. European stocks have had the longest streak of losses going back to December. There is a shift, even as Fed speakers talk about the potential for resilience. We got what we heard uh, from Loretta Mester, uh, Bostic, those on deck. Fed Governor Michelle Bowman yesterday was speaking, and she said this. <clears throat> I supported the FOMC's decision last week to hold the federal funds rate target range steady and to continue to reduce the Fed securities holdings. However, I believe that additional policy rate increases will be necessary to bring inflation down to our target over time. Tom, this <coughs> is the belief. Even if some of these Fed officials supported a pause, they do think they need to go again. And that is sort of what we heard from Jay Powell yesterday yeah, as well. No question about that. And and. Uh, you know, I make joke about the speakers, but I agree the speaking tone here forward is going to really be key. No es question about it. Especially from Lindsay Piegza, who has been <clears throat> calling for benchmark Fed funds rates possibly above 6 percent based on the resilience that she was seeing. She's chief economist at Stiefel. Joining us now, Lindsay, why is now and today different than two months ago when everyone was talking about recession and it evidently was nowhere in sight? Well, I think it's different now because the Fed's message has been a bit more clear. The market was anticipating that the Fed would move to the sideline in this need to assess financial market stability, to assess the real impact of earlier policy initiatives on the real economy. But historically, the Fed has struggled to re-engage after moving to the sideline. So the market was beginning to anticipate that this was the terminal level, that the Fed may be nearing that final peak <coughs> in Fed funds. But the commentary from the Fed is, no, no, in no way should this be seen as an end to policy firming. We were simply taking a temporary breather, a temporary stay in policy. And as you noted, right. even those Fed officials that supported a pause have been very clear that inflation is still elevated and the Fed will need to re-engage potentially as early as next month. Lindsay, the importance of Stiefel is a Midwest feel, and what the old Northwest from a million years ago. The view from Minneapolis, not from New York City, where we're navel-gazing at skyscrapers going under. Terrific Bloomberg story out this morning, I believe it was, on this commercial real estate debacle. Forget about that. Lindsay, what does your scenario above 6% do to the American housing market, ownership, and rental? It's going to be difficult. As we continue to see borrowing costs rise, interest rates rise, this is going to undermine <laughs> affordability and valuations. So this is a hit to the residential as well as the commercial market. But the bigger risk is that the Fed loses its resolve in the face of this weakness and allows inflation to become entrenched. As we heard from Powell, yes, it will be painful for households continuing to, again, face those higher interest rates. But the bigger risk is that the household 
households continue to face an erosion of purchasing power by allowing inflation to become entrenched. So it's it's a notion of short-term pain right. in order to get that long-term gain for the economy and can getting the, back to a potential growth rate going forward. Can the partial differentials of goods disinflation make up for a stickiness of service disinflation? No, unfortunately, it can't because the consumer has shifted back to that pre-pandemic preference for services. So during the pandemic, Americans were forced to stay in the confines of their homes. We were buying electronics, goods, stuff, anything to keep ourselves and our families entertained. But now post-COVID, we've shifted back to a preference towards services, going out to eat, traveling, getting your hair done. And so right now it's the service component that is primarily driving consumers <clears throat> in, to face those higher uh, prices. Can, can, and that's gonna continue to drive the Fed's need to raise interest rates to tackle inflation. Can I just say that in her brilliant uh, observation there of getting your hair done, in my next life, I want to come back as one of those people that dyes women's hair. Okay. They're like the highest paid people. They make more than Taylor Swift. Why, you know, why wait for the next life? Do, do, you could start training right now. I could. I mean, Lindsay just nailed it there. That's the observation of the day. Do you know what that costs when three women go to the hair place and everybody needs to get a change in their hair color? Do you have something you want to talk There's about? There's like Tom? zeros, you know, zeros to the left. It's very specific. Of you the know decimal. what happens when you go to the <clears throat> restaurant and the napkins a little bit over far to the left? Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay save nailed us. it there. <laughs> nailed it, I so said. So here's my question for you. You talk about how you need to see consumer spending roll over a little bit in order to bring inflation down. We heard from Andrew Bailey over at the Bank of England, his prescription, which is that people just need to stop asking for such high wages, such high wage increases, and companies need to stop being so greedy and increasing their profit margins that it's really shrunk <coughs> during the pandemic. What do you think of that? Well, I think the unprecedented nature of the pandemic led to a number of different inflationary variables. We see supply side inflation, demand side inflation, wage inflation, and to your point, corporate inflation or deemed greedflation, where we're seeing a gross increase in profit margins. And, and this also helps to explain that growing gap between the PPI, actual producer costs, and the CPI, what we're passing on to the consumer. But what this tells us is that it's a very complicated equation of inflation, and the Fed simply raising rates to a historically um, still low level is not going to be enough to get inflation under control. Now, to your point, the Fed's primary concern is that wage price spiral. Because <clears throat> labor is so scarce at this point, because we were paying people to stay on the sideline, because there's still lingering fear of the pandemic, or there's an inability to find that work-life balance, regardless of the reason, we're seeing millions of workers on the sideline, which is leaving businesses desperate for employees. So employees can demand those higher wages, but in response, companies are raising prices. And as consumers are forced to pay more in the marketplace, they demand even higher wages and so on and so on. So that's what the Fed is trying to stem, trying to tap down that need for demand, tap down that level of investment, in order to slow the economy. Remember, the Fed is looking for a slowdown, yeah. not necessarily an outright recession, but the Fed does want to see the economy slow because only then can we see a slowdown in the demand side of the inflation equation, yeah. which is really the only component the Fed can control. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that probably workers won't hear Andrew Bailey's prognostications and say, oh, I guess I won't ask for such a big wage. And I guess that people uh, in the C-suites aren't going to say, I guess we're going to just allow smaller profit margins. Jenny Yellen said yesterday in an interview with Bloomberg that the odds of a potentially a hard landing or some sort of recession have gone down because of the resiliency of the labor market. But she talked about the need for a slowdown in consumer spending, to your point. But Torsten Slock said the only way to get inflation really to 2% is to crush demand and slow down the economy in a more substantial way. Is this the reason, Lindsay, why you don't believe that we can get some sort of soft landing? Because in order for them to get to where they want to go, they have to make more progress than they've showed any signs of making so far. Absolutely. And again, the notion that the Fed is going to back off from further policy tightening if we do see a slowdown in the economy is, again, that backwards thinking because the Fed is trying to slow the economy. So when we see that first negative print, I, I think that will actually embolden the Fed that finally 
earlier policy, policy initiatives are having the intended effect. So we may not see a, a, an extremely <clears throat> deep or prolonged right. downturn in the U.S., but we do need to see that slowdown, that first negative print, which we're still expecting by the end of the year or early 2024, right. despite that earlier resilience of the consumer in the first half. But the raging debate here, and Lindsay, I'm going to get you out in front of the, egg of the great Adam Posen here because you're so good at this. And I'm going to go to Northwestern University. Did you ever sit in a course with Professor Gordon, Robert Gordon? Did you ever I have did. the privilege? I did back in okay. the day, yes. Robert Gordon thinks this discussion is absolutely insane. The bottom line is, and there's a lot of out in the media this morning on his folks, is Bailey's living some Keynesian redo from a previous century about wage dynamics. There's a lot of American economics that just simply says that's nuts, right? Well, I, I think it's a difficult argument because we still are seeing the, the, the traditional metrics of, again, that scarce resource in the labor market. That's what it comes down to. Unless we see a meaningful pullback in demand <clears throat> for workers, meaning investment has slowed and, and businesses are shuttering their doors, or we see right. a significant influx of the labor <clears throat> supply. So we're pulling those sideline workers back into the labor force. Unless we see one of those two dynamics, I don't see a case for finding that clearing mechanism right. where we can begin to see wages settle back down to a more sustainable oh level. Oh, my gosh. It's going that allows the Fed honest. to get <laughs> Exactly. Okay. That would allow the Fed to get back to that 2 percent level of inflation. This is why Dr. Piggs is on, folks. This is what's called microeconomic <laughs> foundations of macroeconomics. You just got to clinic on it uh, there versus what we heard from Governor Bailey uh, yesterday. She went hiking in Chicago there right at the end, well, market clearing. Great. And, you know, it was like it was like a tour de force of Midwest theory. Lindsay Piegs, a student of the great Robert Gordon, along with Jim Glassman and J.P. Morgan. Uh, wonderful to have you on with Stiefel uh, this morning. I mean, Lisa, your question here on Bailey and the idea of its company's faults because they've raised wages. You know, I, I, I did a speech thing this week and, and, a, and a, a, a woman, her husband's actually a fan of the program. I mean, that's the only way they apologies. let her in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, get a life. And, that's and she, standard she, line. She, she said to me a really important question, which is, 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 Un, are we supposed to have higher unemployment? I mean, is that good to have higher unemployment or to chastise wage increases? I thought we we're supposed to have wages go up. Okay, the uncomfortable tension <clears throat> here is this idea if you take some pain on certain pockets and some people just say, okay, we'll shoulder the pain, you'll lessen the pain into the long term <clears throat> in terms of just how high inflation can go and what that will do to the economy, what that will do to the buying power particularly of the lower income sectors. But who's going to volunteer to take that pain and say, I'll be the one to take a lower wage. I'll be the company to take a lower profit. I'll leave the charge. Right. It doesn't work that way, no, which is the reason why way. I don't think so, which is the reason why Lindsay Piegg says, uh, as you called it, microeconomics, or just how you have to right size it in a more market focused mechanism. I would suggest this is a huge part of the debate with Adam Posen with this after what he did with the Telegraph here a few days ago on the future of 6% interest rates is as well. And the, the raging debate here that we're having, and people go like, Tom, what's your opinion? My opinion is the immovable force of a medical crisis and a stimulus. And we've got all this babble, including from uh, the wonderful Lindsay Piegza, and the fact is we're still talking about the, the Im impute of this, this, this massive amount of money into the global system. If you give people a chunk of cash and they go out and they spend it, that cash goes into or those businesses and then they get those businesses, get more money and it flows into the economy. This is what yeah. people were actually expecting. <clears throat> you know, helicopter money. This is what happened. Well, it was a kind of helicopter money. No question about that. That was brilliant with Lindsay Piegza. Thank you so much from Stiefel. Coming up on our fractured international relations, Ambassador House will join us. Richard Oz, president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Please stay with us. Futures deteriorate down a half a percent. Futures down 23. On radio, on television, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. sure that the civilized world will not let Russia win this war because it's about existential things. It's about the world security system. And uh, 
from my side, I should say that Ukrainians have no intention, no imagination that we may lose this war because it's about our existence. The Prime Minister of Ukraine in a piercing interview with our Maria today or yesterday uh, in London, yes, trying to look forward to recovery, but a very difficult war uh, still at hand. Part of the international relations we're committed to worldwide uh, for you. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell on assignment uh, today. Futures at negative 24 on the data front. Ten-year yield is in. I can't say enough about the recession tone to equities, bonds, currencies, commodities today. And you see it, Lisa, down a stick down 1.5 percent oil. This is American oil, 68.50 uh, for the first time in ages. I talk about a 69 handle on Brent. We're not there yet. All of a sudden today, you see the inverse correlation between stocks and bonds <laughs> assert itself. And it's just a brief hot second, so it's hard to say too much about it. But suddenly, the idea of lower rates, some sort of recession, longer term, isn't necessarily positive for stocks. This is a distinction at a time when that had been the theme. One time, 10, 12, 13 years ago, I really can't remember. I guess I had nothing to do. I thought I'd go over and get a free glass of wine from Richard Haas at the Council on Foreign Relations. I walked up Park Avenue. I went into their wonderful building. And Ambassador Haas walked out, and he did something. was like, well, okay, so what? He, interviewed, he introduced, rather, a new website for the Council on Foreign Relations. He and his team were at least five, if not eight years ahead of everybody else in the digital media game. And I can't say enough about the value of the Council on Foreign Relations website. Right now, Roger Ferguson on a reset of where the Fed should head to on interest rates. And an introduction here of Ambassador Haas, Alyssa Ayers of Georgetown, on what we don't know about India. Richard Haas, wonderful to have you on uh, today. Professor Ayers of Georgetown is blistering about how India wants to deal with the United States. We saw Modi at the White House. Was it a fiction? It wasn't a fiction, Tom, but there's enormous hype in terms of what India is going to do for and with the United States. I mean, think about it. Yes, it's a fast-growing economy. It's the most populous country in the world. But there are some important buts uh, when it comes to uh, India. It's, it, it still gets most of its arms from Russia. It's buying copious amounts of Russian oil and gas. It hasn't supported us diplomatically there. It's a reminder that India always hedges in, a, in its foreign policy. And yes, there's growth in our economic relations, but as everyone who would come on your show would tell you, who does business there, it's still extraordinarily tough to gain access to the, to the Indian market. Mm -hmm. So a, kind of, a lot of happy talk about the United States and India. Is it just too far away? Is it, you know, like a, a Patrick O'Brien novel on the other side of the world? <laughs> uh, look, we, no, I don't think that's the issue. Uh, and I think, again, what's also driving it here is domestic politics. Turns out the Indian American community <laughs> is the wealthiest community of any other community in the United States. There's obviously powerful political reasons. No, it's just, it's just difficult. We don't have a great tradition of cooperating with India, and people, I think, are, are hyping it, which is not to say there's not, some, there's not something there. There is. There is growing strategic cooperation, growing economic trade and investment. I just think people are exaggerating the upside. In the meantime, during the conversation the President Biden had with Prime Minister Modi, he poo-pooed some of the controversy around calling Xi Jinping a dictator, saying it's not a big deal. You know, he is, and I'm going to head over there and meet him. Do you think that that was enough to quell some of the concerns about the renewed tensions that he ignited? Well, it wasn't helpful. First of all, saying that Xi Jinping didn't know about the balloon incident, the President may have thought he was helping him. But if you're the guy who is really in charge of China, you don't like being reminded that you may not be 100 percent in charge. The dictator comment didn't help. But I think at the end of the day, China is worried most not about what Joe Biden said. He's worried about new economic restrictions, export controls, and so forth. So what they want to do is try to put a limit on what's introduced in that realm. And come November, President Xi Jinping wants to meet with President Biden here. So my guess is they're going to overlook this latest diplomatic incident.
Given that heading into this year, you were among the people saying it's one of the most fraught times we have ever seen on a geopolitical stance. Do you think that those tensions have abated, that we've moved away from the brink and it feels less perilous now? Or do you think people are just taking a pause and focusing on things like the Fed, like the Bank of England, and will be reminded of the geopolitical pressures later on? Yeah, at the risk of not giving you the answer you want, uh, the tensions haven't gotten any less. Uh, possibilities, you know, what happens next with Russia and Europe and Ukraine, none of that's gone away. The dangers of continued war escalation. The United States Chinese relationship is still searching for a floor. We're tired of the Middle East, but the Middle East isn't tired of us. You've got Iran still on the brink of nuclear weapons. I'm actually even more worried in the short run that the Israeli Palestinian relationship could blow sky high. I think it is very close to the edge of extraordinary uh, eruptions of, of, of violence there. We're doing nothing on climate, really, to, to speak up. So when I take a step back, I go, no, I see no evidence that the world is becoming a, a more stable place in this era of what you might call geopolitical revival. Richard Haas, summer reading at Congress in the House of Representatives in a fractious Senate is everybody has to read your bill of obligations. It's a superb short effort. Folks, this is the book to throw at the offspring this summer when they're mouthing off all their political verbiage, either right or left. Just say, shut up and read it. Haas, the bill of obligations. How are we doing on Capitol Hill, Ambassador Haas? Is anybody reading your book? Well, first of all, Tom, let me say that's the that's truly the most interesting book endorsement I've ever received uh, in my life. So I want to I want to put that on the cover of a uh, of something. Look, I think a lot of people in Congress and beyond know there's something wrong here. That American democracy is off the rails. There's obviously not a consensus on what to do about it. But as I go around the country talking about the Bill of Obligations, people know it. It resonates. Uh, more interest in putting civics in our schools, much more interest in reviving uh, public service. A sense that, again, we somehow lost our way and there's a price uh, that we could we could well pay. So I, I'm actually somewhat encouraged. Again, we're not there in a consensus on what to do, but I think there's greater acceptance that we really do have a, a serious problem on our hands, and it's a problem that transcends any single individual in our politics. Richard Haas, thank you so much. The Council on Foreign Relations, I really can't say enough, folks, about the website. This weekend, it's certainly a weekend to read in for the second half of 2023. Terrific essays. I come in to you, Roger Ferguson, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve System, as he talks about uh, Lisa Clarida, also Vice Chair Clarida, talking about can we get back to 2 percent, can we back, get back to a 1.8 percent run rate on interest rates, and there's some smart people going, maybe not. Well, and what will it take to get there? Uh, this <clears throat> just crossing the terminal, I know that you pointed to this as well, Tom, that traders, based on money markets accounts, are now pricing in that the Bank of England will raise rates <clears throat> to six and a quarter percent, which would be the highest going back to 1998, implying another one and a uh -huh. half, no, one and a quarter, excuse me, one and a quarter points of further tightening. I wish John was here, because he's expert on the difference, on, just to pick one thing, their real estate market. Adam Posen, uh, leads on this a few days ago in the Telegraph, but maybe that's a seat change this week and into this Friday and into July as all of a sudden more people are saying 6%, as we heard from Lindsay Piegza. That's a new phenomenon. And you point to the housing market, and rightly <clears throat> so. There are different interest rate sensitivity profiles for different countries. In the U.K., there aren't the 30-year mortgages that they have in the U.S. to the same degree where they don't necessarily see some sort of increase, real-time increase in their payments on the heels of this type of rate increase. Yeah, well, it's a huge, huge uh, change there that we saw with the 50 basis point uh, idea uh, yesterday. Lisa, I've got to go to oil now, down a dollar eight sixty-eight point four three. I don't know what the response here from OPEC Plus is, but it's got to be tangible. I mean, they've shown their cards. They've come out and said, Where, "Where's Will Kennedy? Can we get Will Kennedy on today? Or see on a? He's probably work from home, or you know, work from Brighton Beach, or <laughs> well, you know, I assume it from does take time for them to even inquire. I'm just <clears throat> suggesting yeah, well, as much. He's got a huge staff where you know you can barely get a hold of the guy. But the answer is, I'm sorry, we got oil moving today as part of the recession indicator. We barely mentioned the two's ten spread, a hundred and two basis points on a monthly chart." 
All you need to say is the word never. We've never been there with a full percentage point difference between the two-year and the 10-year yield. An extraordinary day. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. The economy is just not as interest rate sensitive today as it has been in the past. When the Federal Reserve says 50 basis points, the market's saying unlikely. It's going to take a while for a central bank that has avoided raising interest rates to gain the credibility of the market. Monetary tightening will trigger recessions in a number of different countries. I think a soft landing is very difficult. The bond market is just screaming that tougher times lie ahead. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Ramos, and Tom Keen. Bloomberg Surveillance from New York on a Friday. Fair on assignment. We'll Vacation. give you details on that in the 8 o'clock hour. We oh, need well. a brief. You know, an 8 o'clock hour is like, um, I think that's like we're talking 2 p.m., 3 p.m. in Europe. And, you know, he'll be, you know, We're going to give a full brief. And, we'll give a full discussion a full of brief his schedule. Of, on of, his, of, uh, of that as well, yeah, as, as best we can. <laughs> Anyways, things on a Friday are different. When the central banks change, we change. The one thing that hasn't changed is it's guess the recession Friday. There's no question about it. And the intensity of this is tangible. You think it's a sleepy Friday. You've checked out like Damien Sassauer. No. <laughs> There's a lot going on today, and we're going to bring it to you. Futures negative uh, 23. Lisa, Switzerland, Norway, the huge announcement out of the United Kingdom, truly an uproar about that. And as you correctly stated yesterday, all of a sudden, 6% kind of rates are in sight. Traders actually gaming out six and a quarter percent rates for the Bank of England as of February, which would be the highest going back to 1998 at a time when economies have been so resilient to the rate hikes already executed. That's the key distinction. There is still the determination in central bankers, as we heard this week, to get inflation lower. Bloomberg Commodity Index hasn't cracked, but certainly oil's given us some tension here. $68.30 on oil. We'll talk about the curve inversion <clears throat> later. But the VIX, you know, 13.37 with a 12 VIX uh, yesterday, it just in the last 48 hours, off of this central bank uh, readjust, if you will, uh, there's some serious dislocations within the market into the weekend. Where have we been so far this year? <clears throat> we've been hard landing, we've been wishing soft we landing. NVIDIA. Yeah, <laughs> we've been wishing <laughs> NVIDIA has rallied said. through the whole thing, and Tesla, for that matter. Uh, then all of a sudden, it was no landing again. Are we heading back to hard landing? <clears throat> was this week the week where we shifted narratives? And it's important to say this. You might say it's babble, gobbledygook of economists and analysts or and Mark or me. Uh, but it's what drives some of the sentiment around the edges, particularly yes. for investors who decide, mm, maybe let's just cash in some chips. In the last hour, we had Anthony Dwyer publishing at Canaccord Genuity with his caution. Greg Bottle, I thought, was brilliant with great respect to his derivative abilities. And Greg Bottle made really clear the left tail of the curve is substantial right now. Especially given that you are seeing a softening. The PMIs in Europe, I don't think we can overstate. This idea that in France, for example, we did see services roll beneath the uh, the top line, roll beneath the line into contractionary territory. This is a shift. Do we see the same thing in the United States at a time when people are counting on consumers to keep yeah, spending our way into something that's soft and nice that gets inflation I had to lower. look at the Red Sox shut out against the Twins yesterday, so I missed the Yellen story. Brief our audience, Lisa. On Chair Yellen, dare I say more optimistic, the Secretary of Treasury more optimistic than the governor of the Bank of England? <laughs> Certainly more optimistic, saying in an interview with Bloomberg that she sees a lower uh, chance of recession, but does add that we need to see consumers stop spending so much. So not Andrew Bailey, not a full Bailey, stop asking I for like wages, that, full Bailey. <laughs> but definitely that. saying my odds of it, if anything, have gone down talking of recession because look at the resilience of the labor market and inflation is coming down. I'm not going to say it's not a risk because the Fed is tightening policy. But inflation coming down, Tom, is not the same as getting back down to 2%. And we oh, know that you. that last mile, oh, as we keep the, hearing uh, about, stop it. The is different. Anybody can, can say the disinflationary vector's in place. There's just a question of your belief in what the timeline is and the ramifications to GDP. Well, I mean, it varies nation. Maybe, nation. although if you do have this sort of bifurcated recovery where you have some cylinders running uh, at, at 100 and others kind of idling along, and this rolling recession starts to consolidate into something a little bit more connected, that becomes a problem. 
pretty lonely in here. All I can think of is um, Pharaoh save me. You're feeling lonely? I'm more optimistic about this than you are. I'm optimistic on the resiliency of America. Bruce Kasman features this in the mid-year outlook of J.P. Morgan. I think we're going to see a lot more of this. You're going to see it from optimists like Neil Dutta and, and others that we will adapt, will adjust, and the pandemic promoted an American resiliency, even if it's not a boom economy. If you're bullish out there and you think that companies can adapt and adjust, please send Tom some notes of love so he feels a little less lonely. That's my public service announcement. Saved by the, the Bramo brief this morning. <laughs> Why don't you brief us here so we can stagger forward? Can I get right. some more tang, please? Fed speak. Let's discuss it. We get Atlanta Fed, uh, Fed's uh, Bostick at 7.30 a.m. and Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester at 1.40 p.m. 9.45 a.m. This is my key statistic of the morning. U.S. S&P Global, U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMI for the month of June. Do we see a similar trend in the U.S. with services starting to roll over? And today and tomorrow, on the politics front, the Republican Faith and Freedom Coalition Conference in Washington uh, begins. It's a two-day affair, and all of the uh, <coughs> likelies are joining the pageantry I, I, of potential nominees, Republican nominees for the president. I'm really glad you chose to do this because I was not aware how quick the debates are upon us. I'm going to guess August 23rd. It's something in that vicinity, like near Jackson Hole. But it's just not that far away. Bring up the screen again on radio. It's Hollywood Squares. <laughs> um, Soupy Sales, I think, is, is, is running here. But there's a guy named Trump down in the lower right corner. Oh, we all yeah. know him. But I'm sorry. There's some unknowns here. And you sort of go, OK, why are they running? And it's, in, you know, this is for our politically. Where's the Emory Horton? I, I don't know, but maybe she's also She on takes a more Island vacation tour. days with Pharaoh. And that's <laughs> it's also going to be former <laughs> President Trump and former Vice President Mike Pence, which I imagine might be a little awkward. That'll be something in the hallway, <laughs> to say the least. We're going to drive forward here in a debate on the market. And as we talk to people really cautious this morning, let's talk to somebody fair and balanced. Linda Dussel, uh, decades of experience with Steve Auth and the team at Federated Hermes. She was lights out last time she was on. Are you guys bulls or bears? I mean, Federated has such a venerated steady as we go. Are you bulls or bears, Linda? Well, you know, it's good morning. And it's hard to say bulls or bears. You're talking about what kind of landing we were having. We've been saying for the past, let's say, 12 months, we'll have a rocky landing. And that does include kind of the rolling recession that you were speaking about earlier on. And so, um, you, you know, it would have been a lot rockier in the stock market as we were expecting to maybe even test those lows if we didn't have that AI uh, narrative that went on and then the, the run up in the big, big stocks. Because as we all know, underneath the surface, the average stock is only up a couple percent year to date. Linda, do you think this is a tipping point in terms of an understanding of how far central bankers are willing to go and what that means for the revenues of a lot of stocks that have done pretty well this year? Uh, well, no, I don't particularly think so. I mean, I, I realize that they made a, a big move over in uh, in the UK. And thank goodness uh, we're in the US as versus the UK. They have a bigger problem than we do on inflation. We have always said that they will continue to bring inflation down to a level, maybe it's three or maybe it's two. And if we take the Fed at their word for 2%, it's going to be higher for longer. And we have said that at Federated Hermes for a very long time. Uh, the question is, will they call victory at 3%? Because if they do, we may get out of this with just the rocky landing. But if they don't, they will tighten into a real recession. So if you don't think that anything really has changed, and we're kind of in the same place we were two weeks ago, even though the narrative has shifted, is this a time to buy? Is this a time to look for some of the weakness and then say, all right, we can step back in? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting about the, about the narrative shifting because, you know, we get I get hundreds of emails uh, a day from our Wall Street sources, and it seemed like everybody got a memo at a moment that said, OK, now we're overbought. <clears throat> now it's time to maybe take some money off the table. Why? And, uh, you know, and uh, the technicians are out there saying maybe 4,200, we test 4,300 anyway on the downside. July anyway is a weak month. You can use all these statistics <clears throat> historically and say fundamentally what's going on in our economy. Fundamentally, right. actually, the economy is very strong. And what I think people fail to continue to appreciate is still the amount of stimulus, unbelievable outside stimulus. I just read a <clears throat> statistic that said that liquid assets for consumers are four. Point four trillion dollars greater than what they were at the end of 2019. And we were doing just fine at the end of 2019.
I mean, this is really important. I got eight ways to go here, uh, Linda, and I'm going to go to what Lawrence McDonald did in a terrific essay this week. He outlined the wall of money in ETFs, mutual funds, and the rest of it that animals like Federated Hermes are dealing with. Is all this market about is just a ginormous first order condition, which is a wall of money trying to find a warm spot? Well, it's very much a huge piece of it. And that wall of money is not just looking for a place to invest. That wall of money is out there spending, and particularly on services. And it will be interesting to see what the PMIs say. But whatever information we've got about confidence, not just consumer confidence, but house, housing confidence has been very, very strong here lately. Airline uh, information that I just saw this uh, just, I think, the other right. two days ago. Airline information <clears throat> is very strong for this summer. So uh the recession's too early. Yeah, I don't want to, I, I, Linda. I don't want you to talk about a specific portfolio, but if I'm looking at a federated portfolio, and we're in the old days, you had two or three or four percent in Microsoft or Apple. <clears throat> Let's say on a prospectus basis, it's elevated up by growth to eight percent or ten percent. Are you guys forced to sell these big tech companies when they become so big? How do you handle that? Well, of course, we have uh, portfolios that are stock bond portfolios that are all across the spectrum, and we have our objectives. Uh, there, there is no particular requirement, but each portfolio manager will have an objective that says once a particular holding gets above a, a particular level, maybe 5% or so, then they'll, uh, they may want to trim some of that because it gets to be outsized. Of course, this is one of the reasons why portfolio manager, managers have had a very difficult time beating the S&P this year. Because you can't hold as much in the S and P uh, as yeah. the S and P holds in these big names. Linda, thank you. Linda Dussel with the Federated Hermes there on the responsibility of like actually being in the market with your 401k. But if you're in triple leveraged, right now it's a 201. Okay. You tell me that you feel lonely, <clears throat> and then you tell me you haven't gotten out of triple leveraged all cash for the past three years. So you know. Well, I, you know, I'm trying to write the first ticket. I was thinking like, you know, an odd lot. I wasn't going to go 100 shares, but, you know, like 42 <laughs> shares of Apple. But I just can't pull the trigger. You know, I just I just just too much stress, and particularly like I look at 4400 on SPX Standard Poor's 500. It is down half a percent. We were remiss yesterday, Tom. We did not discuss a story <clears throat> that I, I think really has legs in, in many different ways. So, you know, that. Meta is trying to come up with some sort of Twitter rival on the Instagram platform. Yeah, it's percolating. Right, and they've been talking about this. So there's this long-running feud <clears throat> between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, and it percolated out onto Twitter, uh, where Elon Musk challenged Mark Zuckerberg to a cage fight. Did you see this? Did Ed Ludlow put you up to this? And <laughs> this, to me, was fantastic because then, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said, sure, let's go, because he's you know, training in some sort of jiu-jitsu or judo or something. Oh, and um, all I could say is I, I really like Musk's response. He said, I have this great move that I call the walrus where I just lie on top of my opponent and do nothing. Are, are the, is, is Facebook actually going to pull this off? <laughs> I don't th You mean you're talking about the Twitter platform, the Twitter not necessarily platform. the cage fight, Twitter's right? changed. Twitter, you know, <laughs> yes, full disclosure. And, and you know, I can bore people with the story of how I got involved with Twitter. Nobody needs to hear it right now. But I can state categorically it's changed. There's no question about that. Well, I would agree with that. <clears throat> Nobody and cares what my opinion is, but the <laughs> fact is I can state it's changed. Which is the reason why people are looking for some sort of potential uh, competitor. Just to let you know, from The Independent this morning, our producers point out that Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg were, quote, dead serious about the cage fight. That, according to the UFC boss, and they had proposed Las Vegas as a potential place, an appropriate place for a cage fight between the two leaders of tech companies that have driven the gains, I should say, for U.S. equity markets so far this year. Well, they have. I mean, they could do, they're going to have a cage fight on price to earnings ratio <laughs> yes. uh, as well. Let me see if I can get that up. Facebook, we're looking at a 23 uh, level. And Tesla, uh, it's not a 23 level. Uh, Tesla PE multiple. It's like 50. Uh, <laughs> like way up there, like 70. Stay okay. with us. Too much math. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. We had an incident that uh, caused uh, some uh, some confusion, you might say. But President, but the Secretary Blinken had a great trip to China. 
I expect to be meeting with President Xi sometime in the future, in the near term, and uh, I don't think it's had any real consequence. And we had to dictate that this would be a thought that we would show a little bit of video for you this morning with the President of the United States walking back from a delicate moment. I don't have the exact verbiage in front of me, but he alluded to the dreaded D word in terms of the leadership of China as a dictator. Well, he talked about not mm. only referring to Xi Jinping as a dictator, but also suggesting that he didn't understand or know <clears throat> about the spy balloon that was over the U.S. So sort of the one-two punch that didn't get a good reception over in China. Long ago and far away, Matt Winkler, the founder of uh, Bloomberg News, and I think this is something that John Micklethwaite, our editor-in-chief, strongly believes in, is move the bodies around and particularly move the experienced bodies around. And de Curran lived pandemic Hong Kong, and we are thrilled that he is in Washington. Bloomberg Global Economy reporter and new Washington Nationals fan, and de Curran joins us uh, this morning. And uh, how's the view different from Washington than from Hong Kong? You wake up in the morning, how's the view different? It's very different. I've been struck by the focus on industrial policy here since moving here, Tom. I've been struck by the sense of urgency in trying to get America's com economy competitive again on the world stage, especially against China. It's, it's the only talking point here in terms of in industrial production, where investment should go, how to compete in semiconductors and chips and electric cars against China, for example. All of that discussion is very real here. Uh, where I, think, you know, I think in China, in that part of the world, there's a sense that they have advanced in so many areas, moved on. But coming over to the U.S., I realize that there's a, a sense of catching up because they feel they really need to. Akshat Rathi, yesterday with his team, brilliant reporting on Ford Motor Company and the, even the Wall Street Journal with an editorial today on this. Nine gajillion dollars of a loan to Ford Motor to compete with China. And to Curran, what will be the response of Beijing to, to a new, I mean new, American industrial policy? Well, of course, you could argue that the U.S. is now emulating China in some respects. I mean, the U.S. has led subsidization of national, sorry, China has led subsidization of national champions for decades now. That was the whole industrial policy there. Create clusters of <coughs> industries right around the country, build up expertise and know-how in those industries, and then sell and export to the world. And that's how they managed to get such a good run. They gave up on, com on, on combustible motor cars. They've had such a good run on electric vehicles and, and the batteries, of course. So what America is doing in some respects is trying to emulate part of it. And I think that's why it's also causing some tension in the broader Western world, that the U.S. is now adopting this, uh, this industrial subsidy policy, which many are saying is only going to trigger a global race to the bottom in terms of subsidizing national champions, rather, of course, than embracing open and free trade. So it's, um, it's a contentious one, but clearly the U.S. feels it has to to get competitive again with China in some of these areas. It's ironic, Enda, that you're talking about the U.S. in some ways emulating what China did with an industrial policy at a time when China did this to spur growth, and the U.S. is concerned about too much growth spurring inflation, it seems as if an industrial policy is directly at odds with curbing an inflation in the short run. How are policymakers dealing with that? Do they care? Well, again, Lisa, this goes to the point I was trying to make. There's so much going on in the U.S. economy, like you say. It's not just, of course, the industrial policy. There's also this uh, $1.25 trillion worth of money that's supposed to go into infrastructure around the country, be it clean energy, be it new roadways and, and all the rest of it. That's also, of course, creating a lot of demand for labor, a lot of demand for construction and demand for materials. So we do have a bit of a push-pull force going on in the U.S. Nonetheless, though, for all of that, uh, right here, right now, when you, when you listen to Jerome Powell this week, he's making the point that the U.S. might just be able to pull off this soft landing. <coughs> they might just be able to raise rates, cool inflation, without, of course, blowing up the labour market. That seems to, to be where things are right now, of course. Whether or not they can hold on to that a few months from now, it, I guess, remains to be seen. How many more workers does the United States need to affect that type of industrial policy? Well, clearly, some sectors complain of chronic worker shortages, like in the food industry, for example. Some of those, I spoke to a manufacturer here last week, he was making the point that it's still hard to get staff. But in other parts of the labour market, there is softening. Again, Jerome Powell talk about, spoke about that. Recruiting agencies speak about that. There is softening in the margins. Some of those positions, once advertised as vacant, are being taken off the market, no longer considered vacant. And indeed, it is, some companies are finding it slower right. to find staff in some areas. Area. So I think broadly, Lisa, it's a tight labour market, but 
the experts are saying there is some softening coming. And the, the correlation here of all these central bank actions, I mean, clearly the tone of the week is multiple central banks acting. From where you sit with a global mandate, are they correlated or discrete? I think they're just racing to catch up, Tom. I mean, by now, it was expected to be that inflation would be under control, not necessarily back to target, but under control, and these kind of emergency-style jumbo of rate hikes would be behind us. Well, look, that's clearly not the case. The Bank of England having to move by 50 basis points, with warnings of more to come. Other central banks around Europe doing the same. Australia went on pause, then it had to hike again. Of course, we have the Fed went on pause, talking about maybe it has to hike again later on. I think the point is that the inflation cycle isn't over, this massive global cycle of raising interest rates isn't over, and nobody's quite sure where, where it's going to end. And that's, I think, the real worrying point right now, Tom. Uh, central banks have to, of course, get infl inflation under control, but are they going to go too far and push their economies over the, <coughs> over the edge and create bigger trouble down the road? It feels like we're at a very delicate point right, right now. And a one final observation, and I know it's awful late for you, but the Washington Nationals, they're out on the West Coast with the dreaded San Diego Padres. You got to stay up for that. Padres just shut out the Giants of San Francisco. I'm, I'm all in for example. This is baseball. Washington Nationals, Padres tonight. Enda Curran will be watching. Enda Curran driving all of our economic coverage now from Washington after real public service in Hong Kong. One of the moments for me in the pandemic, Lisa, was Stephen Major of HSBC outlining, and of course, his huge and successful responsibilities on interest rates for HSBC. He moved from London to Hong Kong, and he sat here off camera and outlined his process of quarantines, plural, over like a year and a half. And it was just stunning, the hardship that people like Enda Curran and Steve Engel and others in Hong Kong have gone through with someone like Steve Major. Staying in a hotel <clears throat> with people all dressed in white suits that come and swab your nose every couple yeah. hours, not able to go outside for, for a number of days. This has been a reality that really points to your discussion of are we there yet in terms of the post-pandemic normalcy? <clears throat> Torsten Slack of Apollo just publishing, and this really speaks to what we've been talking about, how the Fed is going to have to really address demand in a much more material way. And he looks at how much inflation is being driven by demand, and he said it's actually sticky. <clears throat> the supply-driven inflation, supply side, has come down dramatically. But the demand side, not so much, which really is the issue right now for the Fed. It, it is, and that's where they can control it. And Dr. Piegza mentioned that with Stiefel. That's the one thing central banks can really get their handle on. And, you know, there's a lot of theory we've been throwing around this morning. We're going to address that with a substantial uh, interview with Adam Posen coming up in the next uh, hour. And, you know, we're not going to make it like a boring academic lecture. Nobody needs that on a June Friday. But the answer is all these bright people are testing stuff that's in the textbooks they all worked with, except the pandemic wasn't in the textbook. And that's that dynamic between supply economics, supply-driven economics, and demand-driven economics. And the one word that's encapsulated all this is mystery. Nobody has a clue. Everyone's hoping that they can just <clears throat> take a little bit of pain, right? And hope is not a strategy. But just, you know, spend a little bit less, and then we can bring inflation lower. Just ask for a little bit lower I, in terms I, of wages, and we'll be okay. Just maybe companies <clears throat> make a little less. It's not going to work like that. But this is the problem. If it's a wholesale decline, that's going to be a real problem for a lot of people who are going to lose their jobs. maybe given commercial real estate and the 6% statistic you're talking about, we actually, as, again, Piegs have mentioned, and this is all of Friedrich Hayek, we clear the market, almost Schumpeterian. We clear the market after the pandemic debris, and we move on from there. And that's ingrained in the American psyche. That's, in, you know, we're almost making jokes about Michael, G Robert Gordon and Northwestern. That's ingrained in Northwestern economics. You clear the market and move on. Can they do that in England? How far are we from clearing <clears throat> the market? That, I think, is the mystery. Yeah, right I'll, I'll go with that. It's going to be really exciting. Richard Haas with us here moments ago and Michael, uh, Adam Posen, rather, uh, coming up. But coming up now, PGIBS, fixed income expert Michael Collins must listen for Global Wall Street. Good morning.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everybody. Thrilled you're with us. Jonathan Farrow on assignment. Lisa Abramowitz and Tom Keene here. I'm, I'm sitting here on the break, and I'm looking up to see if the Red Sox possibly will win a game uh, before July 1st. 50-50 chance. Bramo is writing the newsletter. The Bloomberg Surveillance newsletter. It's out. It's in English. How long does it take you to write it? Well, you know, piece by piece, and we do it, you know, as the show goes on. And we've got a fantastic team that helps and put it all together. Really and the interns have really stepped good. up. you got five interns? We have a even? fabulous team. That's yeah, all I can you say. Have, you got, you know, there's someone from Bryn Mawr and, and Barr. You get the whole Little Sisters thing going, right? Well, it really highlights the sort of whipsaw <clears throat> that we felt over the past the couple seven of weeks. Sisters, basically, yeah. <laughs> basically, central banks out, central banks in. People are excited. People are sad. That's kind of where we're at right we're now. We're making jokes about it, but we're really ending the week here. It is a whole reaffirmation of recession. We just had the worst monthly <clears throat> or the worst yeah. weekly loss on global stocks going back three months and the longest streak of losses in European equities going back to December. Futures in negative 19. The VIX was a 12 handle yesterday. We're back to 13.26, which is an oddity into itself. Let's go through the yield space because we're going to do that in a moment. 4.75% in four basis points in the two-year, 3.73% in a substantial six basis points on the 10-year. And the vanilla spread, 210 spread at 102 basis points is enough to give our next guest uh, heart palpitations. We'll let him deal with that right now with a glass of Tang. And Lisa will talk to us. She starts with the stock that I don't own because I believe someone told me Elon Musk was going to go bankrupt like 90 days ago. Yeah, maybe. That didn't work out. <laughs> maybe maybe a cage mash could uh, could change your mind if he does get together with Mark Zuckerberg like he is saying he will. Tesla shares up so far year to date, 115%. Are Those shares kidding? lower by about a percent, eight tenths of a percent. And this comes after being downgraded, the stock, by three brokerages this week, including Morgan Stanley, DZ Bank, and Barclays. Hasn't moved too far okay, too fast. Stop. Is it a sell? Is it a weak hold? This is the game they play. Okay. Is it fair a point. sell downgraded from what? A strong buy to, to a, a buy? Mild buy. There are <clears throat> neutrals. There are what takes some profits. It's a game, but we are seeing it playing out at okay. least a little bit in the shares. Okay. I will say the big shift for Tesla is is it an auto manufacturer? Is it the infrastructure oh, play on. for electric vehicles and charging stations around the country? I can't cite in front of me, but somebody this week looked at the market share that we would see on Tesla out five years, and it craters because there's like 47 people that want their business, right? Well, they want to take their business over, but they also <clears throat> are giving them business. Ford and GM are using their charging stations. Ford, the other auto manufacturer, you talked a lot about them yesterday, about this loan the that they're getting from the government to create three yeah. battery factories. Today, the shares are about four-tenths of a percent lower, but the reason why I wanted to talk about them the Wall Street Journal putting out a story about a new round of layoffs at Ford with cost cutting still yeah. very much a preeminent concern. Yeah. And when we met with John Llewellyn, the the um, the CFO of Ford, I thought he was very direct about the psychology has changed at the auto companies. It reminds me sort of of the airlines. I'm going to call it 10, 15 years ago is is there going to be a sea change in responsibility of ratios? And it seems to be what we're talking about. The efficiency of artificial intelligence <clears throat> and robot assistants that can possibly reduce the number of staff in CarMax. On the flip side, people have been talking about how used car prices have been coming in. People have been expecting CarMax to do poorly. They and like boom, 4.6% uh, gain as their quarterly earnings exceeded all Wall Street estimates. So uh, basically figuring out ways to increase profits, even in the midst of perhaps a bit of softness. KMX, there. they retail automobiles. Richmond, Virginia, 30,000 people. It's a, it's a used car dealership operator. Really? I, 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 I don't know. Really? And they're doing well. Well, they, well, they, they did, were doing well. They went from 40 to 140, then they cratered, and now they're coming back. The story here is <clears> that used <throat> car prices went bananas. 
Then they had a reset, and they're kind of in that reset, although some people say they might start to turn okay. around, and they're still managing to earn profits. It's the next Dow component. That's what, you know, I'm sure John would say that as well. CarMax, thank you, Lisa. That was just absolutely brilliant. Futures <laughs> in negative 19. We're going to save You're ourselves welcome, with a fixed income market. Michael Collins joins now for a brief senior portfolio manager at PGM Fixed Income. Michael, what does this record curve inversion mean to you? How does your world change? when you see two tens, 102 basis points. Yeah, Tom and Lisa, good morning. The dilemma out there, and one of the reasons the markets are so confused and everybody is confused about the economic trajectory is that the typical models, the traditional leading indicators, like, like the slope of the yield curve, uh, all of the empirical evidence, the surveys, are all pointing to recession, right? Pending recession, doom. The problem is from the bottom up, the fundamental analysts in us, and you know, as, as you know, PGM fixed income, we pride ourselves on that bottom up analysis. I always say sometimes the economists tell the analysts what's going to happen, but our view is, is a lot of times the analysts tell the economists <clears throat> what's going to happen. And when you look at the world from the bottom up and you look at all these companies and all these industries and you look at the housing market, the auto market, uh, the mortgage market, the banking system, it's hard to find uh, the areas where you're going to see a big collapse in right. activity, in demand, in lending, in and in, in a big surge in default. So, so we're kind of splitting the difference and, and just assuming that growth is going to slow. You're going to have a moderation in growth, moderation in inflation, but there's really low risk mm -hmm. of, a, of a deep recession here. Within that analysis, do you go load the boat on garbage corporate or, dare I say, high-yield distress? Or do you take the middle ground of a quality corporate versus full faith and credit? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the latter, uh, for sure. I mean, what happens at this point in the cycle, Tom, with the Fed and all these other central banks having tightened policy so aggressively, it does start to bite. And it is starting to bite the weakest credits, the weakest people, the weakest governments. And you're seeing the most levered credits, the, the ones that are exposed to floating rates, whether they're loan issuers or whether they're commercial real estate borrowers, they are starting to get hit, right? So that's the, those are the areas of the market you really want to be careful with and avoid. The good news is, as we've talked about with you many times, the higher quality parts of the market are still for sale. They're, they're offering tremendous spreads, tremendous yields to kind of sit uh, up in quality and print, you know, six handle coupons uh, while you wait. <clears throat> Michael, I have to be honest, a lot of people have come on this show and they say, you know, you come up with a theory and you hold it for a longer period of time and you try to ignore the noise of all the mood swings and we come up here and we say, yeah, 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 but our job every day is to gauge the mood swings and figure out how the shifts are happening. Today, there is a material shift after a week of hawkish speak from a lot of central bankers around the world. Does that shift your view at all? The sense that suddenly we're gaming out six and a quarter percent ECB rates that the Fed possibly is going to go even two more times this year. Yeah, I mean, this happens every uh, Fed cycle, Lisa. Uh, the markets kind of have these blow off tops. Maybe we've just seen that credit spreads rally. We've just seen that there's this enthusiasm right at the end of the Fed hiking cycle. Uh, that, wow, the economy's doing good. And the reason the Fed's able to continue hike and these other central banks are able to continue to hike is because the economy's doing good and it, and it does well until it doesn't, right? And so we're probably at one of those precipices right now uh, where we're peaking in optimism, peaking in sentiment and growth. Uh, and you're going to start seeing this slide. You're going to start seeing those problems emerge, those cracks start to increase growth and inflation are going to be lower in six and 12 months from now than they are today. Uh, but again, the point is it's not going to be one of these, you know, existential credit crises that we've become so accustomed to uh, to experiencing. So you, you wait, you have to be patient. Uh, you wait for those cracks and then you jump in. I mean, look at the regional banks. We've been underweight regional banks. A lot of them just issued the big super regionals and we covered and went to an overweight, right? Those are the types of things you have to be patient for. This is something we're not used to. It's not 2008. Everyone was looking for a 2008 corollary, but there still will be pain. How do you game out what the right level is? What are you looking for in terms of a sell-off to make, say, high-yield bonds look attractive, some of these other credit instruments that you're staying away from? 
Yeah, the, the mistake a lot of uh, folks are making, Lisa, is they're looking at all the historical relationships, right? And they're looking at high yield spreads in a typical recession go out to 800 basis points or 1,000 basis points. And in today's world, that would be a 15% yield, right, which is, which is kind of Armageddon. They expect high yield defaults to hit 10%. Uh, that's because they're looking at the old models, looking at some of the past recessions mm -hmm. where you had a lot of leverage, where you had a lot of of excesses and credit buildups, you do not have that now. So, so our our mantra is, you know, 600 spread on the high yield market is the new 800, right? right? If you get into the fives, you're buying high yield in terms of spread. That's a, you know, that's still a 10 or low low right. double digit coupon. Michael, let's go into quality right now. I just looked at the Apple of 2033. The Apple piece out 10 years is half a percentage point, 59 basis points over treasuries. You can look at this, folks, with the acclaimed YA screen and the DDI screen on the Bloomberg. This is how we invented the company. Uh, but the company wasn't invented over Bloomberg surveillance. It was invented over bond analysis, in case there was any confusion uh, there. Michael, is Apple debt full faith in credit? You know, the, the amount of cash some of those big tech companies have, Tom, is really amazing. And Apple's <laughs> right at the top of the list. And all these big tech companies, you know, we look at their equities and they're volatile and they're high beta. In fixed income land, a lot of those big, you know, super mega cap tech companies are the double A's and triple A's. You know, they're the old Exxons and, and banks of, of, of yesteryear. Uh, they're like the utilities because they have so much cash. They print cash. They could pay off all their debt tomorrow if they want, right? Though the spreads you mentioned are really tight. Uh, there's no value there. Uh, we don't own those. We're typically underweight that that whole sector uh, in the bond market and, and focus on the areas where you get more spread. I mean, you could sell Apple at 59 basis points, Tom, and buy a triple A rated CLO. I know that's a dirty word for some people at almost three or four times that spread or excess return. That is a home run. That's an easy trade. And we have that on in a big way. Michael Collins, you bring me to tears. Thank you so much. Michael Collins with PGM in fixed income. Mike, he's at a golf course. Some, I don't know which golf course uh, Mike's at, but Mike, Mike calls in and he says, thanks for mentioning the YA function. You know, he and I tear up when we talk about the original yield analysis function. We had Monroe traders and one day there's this thing on the desk. Mm -hmm. What is this? It's a Bloomberg, and you could do duration and convexity like in like in no time, like before lunch. Do your kids do that thing when you start crying where they look at you very curiously <laughs> when you're reading a sort of sensitive story, and they just sort of give you this piercing, curious, <laughs> exactly. judgmental exactly. look? Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's like ball wall judgmental. That's a, that's a <laughs> Filipino joke. Good morning. If you're just joining us now, the S&P uh, lower by a, about a half a percent after we have seen a soggy week, one of the more notable shifts in tone so far. There was a story that caught my attention, Tom. <clears throat> I really do think this is fascinating. We were talking about Argentina. We were talking about some of the developing world yeah. and the depreciation there. And there's a story that dollars are so scarce right now in Argentina that some companies are turning to the Chinese yuan. Yes. That's what they can get their hands on. China has ambitions <clears throat> to broaden its currency in international trade, and this is an opportunity for them to do so. It's a huge deal, and it was exceptionally sensitive with conversations on air and off air in our recent visit to Gorgieva's International Monetary Fund. To frame this out, folks, and it's different than Turkey, they're all different. One peso, one dollar rather, is worth 252 pesos. A cup of coffee ago, like two years ago, it was 100. The depreciation is permanent and steady. But far more, and Bloomberg has this functionality, the blue dollar, the black market, is a double, 510 pesos. And that is truly a moonshot. On a log basis, the private market is deteriorating worse than the public peso market. Does that function make you tear up as well? <clears throat> it doesn't make me tear up like the YA function as well, but it underscores, as Damien Sassauer would say, the country by country fragility here that's, that these institutions are dealing with, not just the IMF. And how some nations are trying to exploit in, this yeah. to try to broaden their influence. <clears throat> this is something we keep seeing. Something we'll look at on an international basis, on a domestic basis, we'll continue to move forward. Lisa Erickson joining us, U.S. Bank. Uh, wealth Management, we'll talk to her about the allocation here into mid-year and into 2024. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.
the capital requirements will be very, very skewed to the eight largest banks, the GSIBs. There may be some capital increases for the other banks, and there won't, I don't, I'm not, I think none of this should affect banks under 100 billion. Chairman Paul, before the Senate, not the House, which means before Warren and Company, a little bit testy there about, you know, what are we going to do to not repeat the silliness that we saw before? I have an opinion, but I'm not going to give it. <laughs> but? I, mean, I have an opinion. I'm not going to give it. Well, I will say that this is interesting to hear about these <clears throat> comments ahead of next week's stress test results. <clears throat> the Fed's going to come out with those. Do we get a sense of just <clears throat> the fragilities, how much they've been eradicated from the banking system versus persisting into a second quarter of greater malaise if the mood of this week? Is holds. the stress test going to talk about marketing plans where you give billionaires 1% mortgages to bring in a, a gazillion dollars to sit on your balance sheet? I'm guessing not. I'm guessing not either. <laughs> I'm guessing that will not be part of it. Should it be? I guess that could be part of the discussion uh, that we have in the ether. That would be in the in the ether and forward uh, as well. Futures at negative 21. There's a deterioration of the tape. And can I say, Lisa, three days in a row? Yeah, we've seen that. And this is well. Yeah. Yesterday there was a bit of a positive pop by the end of the day, uh, particularly on the Nasdaq. The VIX is see, backed up to eighteen, uh, almost to twenty. Not. <laughs> so you did see a bit of a reprisal in valuation yesterday. Today it feels different, just because yes. of the gloom really led by Europe overnight with those PMIs coming in much weaker than expected. I agree. This is a, an international show today. We're going to have Adam Posen on with us here in the next hour for a substantial time. Lots to talk about with him. I'm not going to make it a theory exercise, but we could do that if we uh, chose. But just tons to discuss here for it. And we're going to take a look at American real estate in the next hour as well. Right now, and this is a really, really important interview because financial media, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, we love to talk about bulls and bears and the separation and all that. Lisa Erickson, senior vice president and head of public markets group at U.S. Bank Wealth, has written the single most balanced research note I have seen in months and quarters. And I congratulate her on that because the hardest thing to do in this business is the boredom of balanced. It's just not what people want to talk about. They want an opinion. They want an angle. Lisa, thank you so much for your courage to be balanced. How lonely do you feel being balanced in equities and bonds? Well, Tom, thank you for your kind words. And you're right. It can be a lonely position to be balanced. We call it uh, neutral, but we think it's the right <laughs> position. And so that's why we're really standing there. And essentially, really, as you point out, we see the risk and rewards as really being on an even scale right now. So our best advice to clients really is to have a neutral weighting to whatever you would typically have long term in both equities and fixed income. If you are balanced in equities, how do 27 stocks that are the market right now, how can you be balanced if the Standard & Poor's 500 is so imbalanced? To your point, the rally this year has been a little bit lopsided, and that has given some concern as to whether it really is a durable bull market. But the encouraging thing is as we look underneath at the technicals, what we've seen really in recent periods, and I know, Tom, you and Lisa have covered this as well, is the fact that the rally is broadening to some degree. Now, we've seen some of those cyclicals and small cap pull back in the last few days. But that broadening has given some encouragement to us. And also on the positive side of the ledger, we are seeing some green shoots in economic activity. So while overall macro activity is slowing, what we're seeing is when we look at the trend, which is more recent uh, ticks on the data relative to the 12 month average, we are seeing less worse performance. Somebody will be listening to this and throwing something at the screen and saying, did you not pay attention to all the central bankers that are determined to kill that positive momentum? That's going to change the game. Does it for you? That is really one of the big risk factors on the negative side of the ledger. And central banks certainly have come out in force both this week and last week to really talk about the fact that inflation remains in their sights and they need to continue to be strong in terms of targeting uh, those price pressures to come down. So that is a concern, both because we're not clearly at the end of the tightening cycle 
And because, as they've well pointed out, those central banks, there's a lagged and variable effect of the past increases on future economic activity. Tom asked that great question about what balance means at a time when the S&P and the NASDAQ are anything but balanced with respect to the leadership. What does it mean for fixed income at a time when the balance has shifted in terms of risks on the long end versus the short end? So right now we are allocating, uh, again, a standard position that clients would have within fixed income. And in terms of uh, uh, positioning in terms of the maturity spectrum, we are actually advocating that clients continue to think about moving more to a neutral position to the benchmark. So rather than loading up on the short end where admittedly those yields are very attractive, also thinking about the forward moves. And while, again, central banks are very hawkish, uh, we have come a long way in the past year. And so they're closer to a potential pause uh, and or pivot. And so, again, moving closer to the benchmark and, and being closer in maturity to the benchmark really makes sense. What do you do in equities, though? I mean, you know, to show my age, do you just buy the Wilshire 5000? How do you how, how do you allocate balanced across small, mid-cap, large-cap, across growth, across value, and even a factor like international investment? So right now, again, we would advocate being, again, closer to that balanced or neutral position across both cap spectrums as well as U.S. compared to international stocks. And really, again, the reason why is when you look across the globe, you have pretty similar forces that we've just been discussing here in the U.S. across those different cap tiers as well as in terms of internationally. And so, again, just mm -hmm. staying at that position and looking for the future opportunity is really the best place we think to be right now. It's outside your purview, but I'm going to ask anyways and be rude. Do you have an S&P target? Do you have a center tendency on where the S&P 500 is going? We do. So we do expect uh, the S&P to continue to move up this year on the back of increased earnings and uh, hopefully stable valuations. But again, really, as we look at those second quarter earnings reports and the possibility of rebound in the second half of 23, we'll continue to revise those estimates. But Again, when we look at what's been going on in terms of the first half of the year, it's really been encouraging. Both consumers and companies have been more resilient than really the consensus expected. Lisa Erickson, this is a high point. Thank you so much. Lisa Erickson, U.S. Bank Wealth Management today. How strange was that, Lisa? That's the most center tendency conversation I think I've had in 18 months. It builds on what we heard from Michael Collins, which I find <clears throat> interesting, yeah. because he was saying that even if there is some sort of downturn, it's not going to be 2008. There still is right. resilience, and you can still think about going in and buying because of that consumer spending. If that's the case, then the concept of fair value, the concept of balance, the concept of how you shift at a time when people are looking for that big 2008-like call. The heart of the matter here, I'm going to uh, support Gina Martin Adams here, the great equity strategist and operator for Bro Bloomberg Intelligence. And what we heard from Ms. Erickson there, folks, is, and, and, and I'm not going to tell you what to do here, it it's not my job, but you got to decide are you a market timer in some way, whether market timing three years or three minutes, or are you just going to participate in the game moving the chess pieces around a little bit? And I, I think about where we are, June 30 coming up, how many people have missed what I'm calling the Ancompora Yardeni rally? Maybe I ought to call it the Erickson rally. I mean, how many people have missed this move because they weren't in the game? And how many may have missed it because it may have already peaked? That's this from Michael Hartnett of Bank of America, which I find interesting. He was he watching and says Lisa Erickson And he said blowing. way too positive. Uh, he's saying that there are early signs of investors fleeing from tech stocks after what he called was a 1999-like rally formed after it formed a, quote, baby bubble. Basically, the technology sector saw $2 billion of outflows, the largest in 10 weeks in the five trading days through June 21st. So there is that other side of the equation where people are basically saying, okay, maybe it's run a little too far too fast while the rest of us yeah, think Apple's maybe we missed it. Apple's absolutely cratered. I think it hit a record high yesterday. I'm not sure. I got a close of 187 on Apple. It's down a little bit. It's down 22 cents, but I don't know. I mean, it, it's a, the number of opinions we're getting. My head, my head truly, folks, yesterday was spinning.
there was so much going on. The narratives aren't even linear. <clears throat> the people aren't even discussing on the same planes, which is the reason why it's hard to get your head yeah. around it. We're going to keep driving the conversation forward. We're already working on next week's work, the dash into June 30 and the move to the third quarter of 2000. 23. On the litmus paper of the system on foreign exchange, Mark McCormick, TD Securities, Adam Posen in the next hour. We've got a deflationary trend that's being recognized in the equity markets. Some of the revenge spending categories are starting to show softness. There's some hope here that you can actually get inflation down and employment is remaining strong. Late hikes don't necessarily mean a stronger currency, but the market's got to have confidence in the central bank's forecasts. I think it takes a long time to rebuild central bank credibility once it's been destroyed. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. The euphoria fades. Good morning. Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on television, on radio. Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. John Farrow is on vacation today, and he will be next week as well, and then he'll be returning to us. Not on assignment, I will just say. Quiet, huh? I will say I also. Didn't know, I didn't know he was on vacation. It's the first I've heard about this. <laughs> so euphoria Thought really seems to be uh, fading away, and there seems to be a marked shift in tone today. He's really on vacation? Yes, he is. So how un-American. Anyway, we hope he's having a good time. Which island's he on this week? <laughs> He'll I tell us all about it. I mispronounced the one yesterday, Ischia. So, I had no idea. It's near Naples. Let's restart it's this program. It's off from Naples. Okay. The euphoria has seemed to have shifted in markets, and it we has. seem to have a very different tone right now uh, with respect to people gaming out recession once again. Central banks very much in the forefront as we well, look out at potential uh, much higher rates than we previously expected. You're dead on. We're making jokes about this, and Mr. Farrow, we hope, is having a good time on assignment. But this is serious this morning. And, folks, into the weekend, into the end of the year, we are on the recession watch. I called it Guess the uh, Recession. And in this hour, to lead with Mark McCormick of TD Securities on the litmus paper of the system, and then to go to Dr. Posen for a lengthy two-part interview sets us up to go, where are we now off of what Governor Bailey wrought? The big question to me is how much do central bankers have to curtail the demand? And the demand side of the <coughs> equation, the key one that Apollos Torsten Slock picked up on, people are still spending. The stimulus that you talked about, the long and variable lags of that that still are percolating through the <coughs> economy, how much do we end up with central banks having to curtail it much further than they thought in order to really end the cycle? of money coursing through the system. I think what you're going to see in the next couple of days is very careful country to country analysis, Lisa, of how people are different. The United States can't be compared to these other countries. I mean, I looked at, uh, of all things, I had no idea how Bloomberg folks actually has Norwegian salmon prices. And it's a hockey stick. It's, it's like here in a year and a half ago, it is an inflationary moonshot for Norway. That's a big deal over there versus this ginormous United States economy. I don't think they're even apples to oranges. I'm laughing because it seems like Tom Keene just <clears throat> discovered, uh, discovered locks and bagels and locks for the first time and how much the prices there have increased. I am looking, though, at the amount that food prices have come down. You have these sort of bifurcated uh, polls where some people say inflation will come down significantly. I think you're right. <clears throat> you're dead on about Adam Posen being an important conversation. When do we shift to we're targeting a 3% inflation rate? Maybe two and a half percent. Maybe central banks don't need to get back well, down to that two percent and inflict the pain that would be required to do we're, so. We're talking about the glide path down to where Clarita is or Roger Ferguson writing in the Council on Foreign Relations. But I believe Dr. Posen and others are saying we're not heading down right now. We're heading up to some form of new higher interest rate regimes. And what's the ramifications for our listeners and our viewers uh, in equities, bonds, currencies, and commodities. That's all there is to it. Meanwhile, the pain trade had been up for equities, for uh, for everything <clears throat> else, frankly. And right now, we seem to be reversing a lot of what the pain trade was doing, not with respect to necessarily a wholesale you know, eradication of gains, but the dollar in particular, I keep keying in on, a market move versus the euro, at one point, the most going back to March. I'm banging the keyboard here, folks. I'm I bringing up the five. Yes, Apple hit a record high yesterday. It's a terrible pullback. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> Why don't looking... you bring in Mr. McCormick and save us? <laughs> Mark McCormick it's joining us now. Mark McCormick, Global Head of FX and EM Strategy at TD Securities. Mark, I'd love to get your sense on the pain trades around <clears throat> the world right now, in particular with a dollar stronger. Yeah, I think all the, the stuff you're talking about, too, is quite fascinating on the disinflation, what's driving it, what's driving markets overall. I think the pain trade in FX, the thing that people are so focused on is really the carry trade. Uh, it's one of the most interesting things if you compare the carry trade G10EM relative to the total return of the dollar, it's the best performing strategy. The one thing that we kind of keep seeing across the factors and the quantitative tools that we track is there's no consistent driver in FX this year. Last year, we had very high sharp ratios trading a couple factors. This year, we're all over the place again. And I think a lot of it has to go what you were mentioning in the beginning. We do not have the same global inflation impulse across every country that we had last year. Very simple way of saying this is the single factor that drove inflation last year was international. This year, it's moving back to domestic drivers. And so that's a perfect point when you look at the RBA, the Bank of England, the Norges Bank, the SMB, the Fed. They're not dealing with the same inflation anymore. So a lot of this is, again, the markets are very confused. But the thing that matters the most is there's a wide divergence between rates in G10 growth in G10 relative to emerging markets where the lower beta trade is still in EM, uh, especially for FX. So that's where everyone's focused. It does seem as though there has been a shift over the past week having to do with Europe. And it's been happening steadily over the past few weeks, but perhaps crystallized in this morning's PMIs. Just now hearing from UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Exchequer over uh, in the United Kingdom, Jeremy Hunt, saying that inflation is the top priority. They're looking to raise rates substantially higher. The pound is weaker. Europe also facing inflation higher, but growth lower. The euro weaker. Is this a theme you could hang on to? Again, I think it's going to be very tricky because there's going to be countries, and we're kind of going back to the analysis we had earlier in the year, which is the housing market. So, like, a lot of people in FX, and again, I think this is a lot of the confusion in FX. There's a knee jerk, which was last year, inflation's higher, I got to buy the currency because the central bank's going to move. Um, and that, again, played very well, and it had very, shy, shy, very high sharp ratios. This year, it's getting very different because what matters, if you even look at the dollar, the dollar has equal sensitivity to growth factors inflation factors and this happens down the underneath the surface of the dollar so if you think about norway and sweden yeah it's great that inflation is rising and the central banks have to tighten rates but what we've seen is norway is trading at a massive discount so there's more upside for naki because it's been trading at a discount you go to sterling right. sterling is overbought our models show that it's expensive it's been one of the best interesting surprises this year is growth revisions in the uk has been better than everyone else so our growth model has been buying sterling even though there's a right. stagflation narrative. But we're getting to the point where rates can be very prohibitive for growth given the pass through into the housing market in the UK. So I think we're now at the cusp here. If rates go higher, markets talking about 6%, that's not good for sterling. Mark McCormick, John from Ischia emails in and says, this is wonderful. What's your target on sterling? What is your target on sterling then? So right now, we're, we're probably, we like it a little bit higher over the months ahead, say 130 is our target, largely because the disinflationary forces that we see coming through right. the U.S. are more powerful, and we think the Fed's done. We think macro volatility is going to stabilize. We think the global economy is still late cycle, not recession, and that basically benefits a rotation of capital outside the U.S. So uh, we still, I would say we like sterling lower relative to other currencies, but again, it gets the boost from a weaker dollar, largely because we mm -hmm. see the U.S. inflation impulse being much weaker. We don't see the Fed hiking again. Mark, to what you mentioned before, which is a foreign exchange market that's of massive ambiguity in 2023, what's your reading on history? How does that break? How does, that, how does the market clear from that opaqueness, that ambiguity? I think the, the key thing that's very confusing for all of, all of us is the data dependency narrative. And I keep saying it's a euphemism for confusion uh, because I know a lot of people focus on what central banks say and they're trying to follow their language, but their language is irrelevant because the data is creating the context of whether or not what they're saying is meaningful. So what we're doing is, is I think a big part of it is we have to shift out of the regime. 
And I think, again, the most important thing that we've had for the last couple of years is the consistent focus on inflation. So if we know if inflation is kind of depressing and we're in and our models, we show inflation surprises, inflation data strength and, and other general inflation indicators that we track from consensus as well. We are in a very disinflationary environment when we look at it globally. So I think what we need to see to kind of move into one phase or the next is really whether or not the global economy moves into a recession. Uh, and we get the rate cuts, or whether or not we're kind of in a softish landing, which is we still get rate cuts, but we're going from restrictive back to neutral. Um, so I think that's going to be kind of the pivot point for us. And I think, again, it comes in the second half of the year because we see the U.S. economy slowing pretty significantly. We also see disinflationary forces moving very aggressively in the U.S. So I think that's the pivot point that we'll get later in this year that says, yes, we're out of this high inflation environment. But yet we are either in a soft landing or a recession, which is we're not sure which regime we're in yet. Given this confusion, Mark, what's your highest conviction right now? Our highest conviction trade is really relative value. So we are short New Zealand versus Brazil. Uh, so you've got recession in New Zealand. Essentially, the RBNZ is tight, tightened, tight, tightened too much. And in Brazil, we've got this very nice carry trade going on. We actually don't see the BCB cutting as quickly as the market, uh, which is looking for it this summer. So we've got very strong growth and in inflation in Brazil, uh, along with nice carry. And another thing we're looking at is relative value in Asia. So selling the renminbi, which again, the PBOC is easing financial conditions. We're looking for stimulus from China. We're looking for ways to sell that, which is very attractive in carry terms against countries like India. We also right. like the story in Korea as the semiconductor industry changes and the AI and the tech stories coming back. And also Thailand, which you have seasonality around the reopening of China and tourism and all those right. things, which is bullish for Thailand. Mark McCormick, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it with TD Securities as well. You know, we have such an informed audience on radio and television. It's just extraordinary. Jason just kills it as he adds value from Oslo to Bergen. There's a new tax on salmon in Norway. This is a huge deal. It split the, the country in two, and it's a substantial tax on what they call aquaculture of this ginormous business in Norway. And he says you just can't look at the salmon inflation there as a discreet idea. I didn't know that. That it was because of the taxes. <clears throat> I wonder what happened to all those taxes in the U.S. that were placed on certain imports. And uh, whether they're sort of they still were, there. Um, they sort they of like disappeared. Ask Christia Friedland of uh, Canada. She'll tell you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for listening. And he's got a Ph.D. in fish from, I think, University of uh, Maine. The percentage move, Standard & Poor's 500, it is a negative six-tenths percent. So here's the thing. Right now we've been talking all day. Does the Fed matter? Does the Fed not matter? And we heard there uh, from Mark McCormick, not so much. Look at the data. What data, right? Because you can paint whatever picture still that you want, depending on what you look at. I think it's pandemic. I, I'm going to go back to first principles here. It's an original set of beliefs, the theories, and this leads up to our conversation with Adam Posen. The, 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 the theories that we construct are belief sets from the most sophisticated like Dr. Posen to the most unsophisticated like me. The answer is our theories are tested right now. There was a former White House economist, Aaron Sojourner, who put out this new ratio that suggests that actually the clout of workers versus the company has come in dramatically, and that this is actually a positive sign for the Fed, that you're actually seeing less leverage by workers. What he does is he compares the level of quits to layoffs, and it has gone back about two-thirds of the rise, retraced about two-thirds of the rise in 2021 and into 2022 so far this year. So you are seeing micro shifts under the yeah. surface that hint at possibly something that could be sort of the soft landing kind of narrative that Jenny Ellen is leaning into. Very Chicago analysis there. I mean, the microeconomic foundations here of what we're talking about, and including with labor share is labor flat on their back for 15 years and the pandemic gave them some strength. That's, well, that's really what happened. I would just offer up and suggest that these are the dynamics that might make a more uh, significant difference than Andrew Bailey saying, just don't ask for as much and then you just, you know, we can kill the problem. You know, I got up at midnight to read in on Adam Posen. I'm so intimidated. I mean, you know, I mean, he's like, he's gonna give us a lecture here on what's going on. For Global Wall Street, all I can say is stay with us for the next half hour. We will give you Adam Posen, the Peterson Institute, of course, a former member of the Bank of England. Good morning.
We've got to get and we will get inflation back to its target. To do that, we cannot continue to have the current level of wage increases. And we can't, can't have companies seeking to rebuild profit margins, which means prices continue to go up at their current rates. But what I would say to people is we expect inflation to come down. And it's important then that price setting and wage setting reflects that because the current levels, I'll be absolutely honest, are unsustainable. The governor of the Bank of England off of the shock of 25 basis points, no, a half a percentage point increase uh, in England, and it's a different England, a different Great Britain than it is in the United States, and that's been one of the shocks of the week. Right now, what we're going to do is do what Bloomberg Surveillance does best, which give you an informed debate on the issues at hand. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom King, John Farrell on assignment. And joining us now is Adam Posen. He's president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He's one of our great American scholars on Germany. And far more than that, had a tour of duty as Megan Green uh, trots over across the Atlantic here in the coming weeks. Adam Posen at the Bank of England years ago. Two days ago, Adam Posen, you made clear that we would see 6% plus interest rates by central banks and particularly by the Bank of England. Will that level, will that crush the United Kingdom economy? It's going to hurt. There's no question, Tom. Thank you and, and Lisa for having me back. The issue is that from the start of this inflationary period in the UK, along with the euro area, the Bank of England MPC majority, the governor, have kept talking as though they weren't going to have to raise rates that much. Even though they kept raising them, they kept talking as though they didn't need to go much further. They probably wouldn't need to go much further. Whereas from the start, you had a UK from 2021 onwards that had the worst aspects of US labor markets made worse by Brexit and EU euro area exposure to energy shocks right. from Russia had them both and have less credibility post-Brexit and post all the political shenanigans of five prime ministers in seven years. So ultimately, it never made any sense that the UK was going to end up with a lower terminal rate for its central bank tightening than the Fed or the ECB. This is important, folks. I'm going to get the theory out of the way here. There's a blistering essay this morning in The Telegraph from Ambrose Evans Pritchard, hugely controversial. But within it, Dr. Posen, he alludes to Emery Lakatos's idea a, a half a century ago of a research program of where you get a set of beliefs going and, boy, you're going to stick with your research program right or wrong. Does the Bank of England have a flawed research program, and do they need to amend it pronto? I fear that they have taken too seriously some of, the, uh, their, some of their models. All central banks have investment in their models, but one of the good things that happened at the Bank of England when I was there during the global financial crisis and in most of the other central banks was you realized under those circumstances, you put the model aside. You don't use it if it's not realistic. Unfortunately, to me, the bank has been relying on a couple mistaken assumptions or worldview. First, that there was no erosion and credibility of the overall UK macro policy regime post-Brexit and post-politics, which clearly is not true. And second, that if there was going to be a major real income shock, which they did rightly call, uh, that that would lead to a decline in nominal wage growth. And that was clearly mistaken. And I and others and other former MPC members like Sister Wadwani were pointing this out as an error at the end of 2021 in their forecasts. And they didn't come off that until very recently. I'm not conceptual like Ambrose. I'm not going to say this is a Lakatos moment or, you know, change of paradigm right. and all that. But I think over the last year and a half, two years, they have stuck with some model assumptions that were publicly questioned. And some of the members, the external members of the committee also questioned. But Adam, are there parallels with the UK and the US and the Federal Reserve, which is currently at a precipice of a pretty key moment? Uh, Lisa, I think it's fair to draw the parallel. Um, I think just as with labor markets, just as with energy shocks, it's worse in the UK, unfortunately, in this instance, because it took the Fed a while to change their view on inflation. 
a bunch of us were beating the drum for them to do that starting at first quarter of 2020. One, um, but the bottom line is they did significantly change it by summer of 2022, and they clearly, from the testimony, they don't have a full strategy, but they are aware inflation is job one. They are aware it's trend inflation. They are aware that it wasn't the transitory stuff. So yeah. I think the Fed got out of its own way to some degree. We are discussing this concern about whether the Fed can get down to a 2 percent inflation rate without causing pain that perhaps people are unprepared for, something that you raised a while ago, that perhaps it's better to get to a 3 percent rate and be more comfortable with that higher rate. Where are you now in terms of what the Fed has done and where it is heading in terms of inflation rate based on how much it's raised rates so far? I would love for Chris Waller and others to be right. Love to see uh, vacancies continue to come down without unemployment rising and the pass through from uh, all the previous shocks to be weeded out and therefore not have to have a much higher rate. I think that is a very bad gamble. Um, I'm in fact more hawkish than even some of my colleagues on this, because, even though I'm known previously as an inflation dump, because I see us as having such tight labor markets in the U.S. and such trend inflation persisting, even though it's coming off some, that you're going to need real contraction in the credit markets to get where you need to go. This is really important, now, Adam. What's required in terms of how high rates has to go, have to go in order to get real contraction in credit markets that are resilient? Well, I mean, one way to look at it is that we finally, over the last few months, have spreads on quality spreads between you know different classes of bonds or, or government borrowers versus private sector borrowers that are consistent with the tightening cycle. We haven't seen spreads be that wide, uh, very wide at all until very recently. So similarly, if you, however you want to compute what you think the real interest rate is, we are just now getting to positive right. real interest rates. And so to me, it's, we are only now getting to tight policy. And especially since the residential construction and employment proved very resilient to interest rate rises in a way that we have not seen before. That to me is the biggest surprise in right. the U.S. Um, it, it tells us that the amount of monetary tightening that's been done so far is insufficient. Now, maybe what we're just now gotten over the last couple of months will prove sufficient, but I'd rather err on the side of tightening more and that the, the U.S. economy oh, yeah. say, a, won't fall into recession. We've got Sorry. time for one more question here, Adam. We're going to bring you over to the next half hour, folks. This conversation is so important with Adam Pose and the Peterson uh, Institute. It's real simple, Adam. There's a whole school of thought out there with disinflationary vectors in place, and we're being successful. And I want to talk about the navel gazing of do we get back to 2% or whatever in the next section. But right now, are you suggesting that we completely misjudge how we will extend the X axis of these high interest rates and we will see a 5% or, dare I say, 6% milieu well out into 2024? My central call is that they're going to get above 5.5 before the end of the year, and it's going to remain there into at least second quarter of 2024. And unlike some other people, I think that the risk is more that they may have to do more than that and not so much that they're going to have to do less than that. Adam Posen with us, the Peterson Institute, and of course he has led with his colleague Olivia Blanchard on where will these central banks, all the central banks, where will they reset uh, into 2025 and beyond distant from a pandemic? And Lisa, I'm sorry, this is the dialogue. It affects everything we do in finance, the banking system, and also our investments as well. And it's not the short-termism of the financial media. It's where are we in 26, 27, 28? given the, the follow-on of his Blanchard says the Biden stimulus. Well, we're going to carry on that very <clears throat> conversation coming up in the next hour on The Open. Peter Shear of Academy Securities, who said that the Fed was not in the driver's seat. Is that still the case? Victoria Fernandez of Crossmark and Aaron Kennan of Clear Harbor, as we parse out just the point that you made, Tom. It's going to be interesting to see futures and posing driving the market lower. Futures at negative 25. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning to all of you on radio and television. An extraordinary Friday. We're reading in for the weekend. The huge tumult we've seen in the week with central banks moving rates up. Some real gloom about recession. Seen in oil, 68.52 on West Texas Intermediate is all you need to know. The 2 10 spread borders on record steepness and negative 101 make it negative 102 uh, basis points. Extraordinary in uh, version. What we're doing, we're talking to a cross section of people, and we've certainly seen seen that in views on the equity markets, some huge caution, some optimism, blinding neutrality from uh, U.S. Wealth Bank. And we're also driving forward the conversation wrapped around theory under question. For Global Wall Street, this has been a joy for the last 15 minutes with Adam Posen. And we continue now. And with me as well is Michael McKee, our Bloomberg International Economics and Policy and Theory Correspondent when the theory is thrown out the window. Mike McKee, to you first, question for you, and, and that is how bad has the theory been blown out the window? I mean, I mean, a Posen has to act Posen-like and, you know, future central banker-like. Yeah. You don't. Uh, well, I, I was listening to Adam <clears throat> earlier, and I think he's right that uh, it's not just the Bank of England. It's all economists uh, basically work off of models that mm -hmm. have worked for 20, 25, 30 years that aren't working anymore. Now, some <clears throat> discarded those faster than right. others. And uh, certainly the, you could say the Fed did not, uh, the Bank of England did not, um, but now they are to varying degrees adjusting. And that's the question, though. Um, what do you do? Where do you go if the model doesn't work? You can try to figure out why and readjust <laughs> the model. Right. But they become more guidance than uh, and, uh, any kind of a real path forward. We continue with Adam Posen, the president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Adam, I'm going to get right to it and frame here the path down to 3 percent. In a raging debate led by your work with your colleague Olivier Blanchard, John Williams as an R-star subdued, and we will get back near a two-ish percent. You disagree, but what's the nuance now? What's changed in where we are heading within this new level for Fed rate policy? I don't think much has changed, but in the spirit of the conversation you and Michael were just having, I think more needs to change. So what we had was a series of central bankers repeatedly saying throughout the last couple of years, do means do, and then saying sotto voce, but audibly, look, it might be better to get that to stop at three or to be slow getting to two, but we can't admit it now. And my belief, which was part of my belief when we were advocating and designing inflation targets in the first place, was the point of inflation targets was to communicate in a credible way with the public. And so I think between a choice of saying you're going to two, but then taking your time about it, and then maybe in a Fed review in two years time, you sort of admit that you were not going to two, is not preferable to saying we're only going to three and since and this is actually a virtue of how bad things are if you get if you take us down from eight to three you're still pretty credible disinflationista yeah. what's the venn diagram look like of adam posen in a rules-based john taylor can we be rules-based if we get back to a posen blanchard three percent well inflation targeting the part of it I'd like to keep is always been what I called this discipline discretion, co-authoring with the late Thomas Laubach or what Bernanke in Michigan called constrained discretion. The idea that it's intermediate between rules and pure discretion. And I think Professor Taylor has been right about a lot over the last couple of years, but I still am not sold on the idea of the rule. What I am sold on is the idea that you can't deviate from the target without explaining yourself and adapting the target. And so I don't know about a Venn diagram. I think we both agree would agree you need a lot more inflation, disinflation than we've had, that the Fed was behind the curve and had a wrong idea. But ultimately, it's not because they didn't have a rule. It's because they had a wrong idea. Well, Adam, if I can follow up on the idea of whether or not you want to raise the inflation target, do you have a lot of confidence one way or another that 2 percent is wrong or 3 percent is going to fit the economy that comes out of this whole thing? Because at this point, it seems like we don't really know. We don't have a good grasp on where inflation is going and how fast. 
It's fair. It's a fair question. I, I, I want to go back to one one basic point, which was when we, Bernanke, Michigan, Laubach, and I wrote the inflation targeting book, we wrote in it and assumed that inflation targets would be reset over time. As I started saying, and I'm only speaking for myself now, not my distinguished co-authors, as I started saying around 2004, 2005, we made a mistake because people treated these inflation targets like exchange rate targets. They were scared to move them because they were worried it gave a bad message. And so, and there was too much convergence among different central banks and different economies all on this 2%, and that just reinforced it. Whereas you should be adapting the inflation to target to the realities, not every minute to make excuses, but every several years to make it realistic. And so to me, there's no question that the higher inflation target would be better. We, well, Blanchard used to talk with co-authors about a 4% target. He's now publicly said he's in favor of a three rather than a two. I've always believed it should be higher than two. Not always, sorry, when I wrote the book, I didn't, but I believed it should be moved as needed. And since 15 years, I believed it should be moved up. So I think there's no harm in saying three because you're still going to be credible disinflating from where we are now to three, and then you're not going to have to go through the major pain of squeezing out that last bit of inflation. Well, let me ask about another communications issue, and that is forward guidance. Uh, the Fed and other central banks really like the idea uh, at various times, but now it seems like they're having trouble communicating with the markets since they're unable to say what they're going to do next. Uh, is that a Fed problem, a market problem, or does forward guidance not work as well as they thought? Forward guidance never worked as well as they thought. Um, I mean, back when I, my first speech after leaving the Bank of England at Jackson Hole in 2012, I made a whole point arguing that forward guidance was never going to work well. Um, and uh, everything since then bears that out. But that doesn't mean you, you just wander around and randomly say, oh, here's today's data. So, like, I look at Bank of England. The issue for me, I know we can talk about the Fed, but I mean, the Bank of England, the issue for me is not that they made the wrong interest rate hikes because they did a lot of them pretty fast, but that they kept saying, well, this will be the last one or we probably don't need to do more or we're going to be able to stop at 4%. And so, again, it, it's, it's not so much about forward guidance. It's about they communicated the wrong forecast. And I think the Fed or the Bank of England has to, or other central banks have to say, our forecast was wrong. We are shifting to this forecast. This forecast may be wrong too, but this is the best guess. And therefore you should expect X. You're not gonna be able to do forward guidance the way you did in the crisis because that was meant as a substitute for policy anyways. Mm -hmm. It was never meant to be a standalone useful tool in a normal situation. I want to get back to Fed policy. I got two more questions, Adam, before uh, you go. You've been very generous with your time. And the basic one is what Mike McKee's going to see in the press conference looking out four, five, six, seven meetings as well. For our audience, what would you suggest will be the market, the real estate reaction, if we get to Posen rate levels? Thank you for generously giving me this much of surveillance time. Um, I think the market's going to be negative, but I don't think in the U.S. it's going to be disastrous, as you and Lisa and John have repeatedly talked about, rightly. This has been an incredibly resilient market in equities, even in real estate. The losses, commercial real estate's different, but in residential real estate, the losses have not been that large given the past run-up, and construction continues. So going back to something we were saying earlier, Tom, I think you're going to need, in market terms, some form of capitulation because that's just the side effect of there being actual tightening of credit conditions. And I think right. we're just getting there, but it doesn't have to be disastrous because we don't have the same fragility, I believe, in the, our financial yeah. markets we did past cycles. At the Peterson Institute, Chad Bono with a great uh, segment on the historic collapse of Switzerland's watch industry. That's how esoteric Peterson uh, Institute can get. One of the things percolating, Adam, in late June is a new bout of American exceptionalism. We're different than they are. Is America exceptional? In a lot of social ways, yes, and a lot of economic ways, no. 
Um, so our racial divisions, our regional divisions, our gun violence, uh, our nativism, uh, these are all things under debate uh, and which are not under debate in a lot of other high income economies. Um, so we are exceptional. In our economy, the economist, as you know, had a great feature a little while back, a great survey talking about the ways in which the US economy powers ahead. It remains to be seen how much of that was sustainable versus how much of that was temporary mm -hmm. fiscal. But ultimately there is some special sauce to the urban in innovative parts of the US economy in services and tech that others have not been able to replicate. And we have right. to take that Dr. as a blessing. We gotta leave it there. Dr. Posen, thank you so much for a substantial mid-year conversation. Adam Posen, the Peterson Institute, formerly as public service to the Bank of England as well. Mike, what do you make of all this? There's a debate here. It's wrapped around theory. We can throw out Imre Lakatos and, and Friedrich Hayek and all these other worthies and giants. Baloney, none of this is in the textbooks, is it? That's really what we're talking about. Yeah, I step back and take a longer view, though, and that's been the history of economics, is that we see economic developments that we necessarily hadn't seen before, and economists come up with new theories. I mean, you start with Adam Smith and go forward from there. You get up, uh, you get to John Maynard Keynes, and then we had uh, the end of Keynesianism and the new economics, and now we have Keynesianism back, and uh, you know, there's just a, a lot of evolution in economics, and there's always the debate about whether it's a real science or a social science, um, and I think it's basically just right. learning by doing. Unfair question. I'm going to do it on this. If we get a Posen world and if we get rates coming up, you're going to be in that meeting. Are you people going to start asking Chairman Paula about the blow up of the real estate business? To me, that's percolating for Q3 is commercial and residential real estate. It has been asked, uh, and uh, the chairman says basically that we are monitoring it and we don't think it's going to be a problem, and there's a, a there are differences. It's a little bit like the muni market. Each muni uh, bond is different. Each real estate loan is different because some are offices, some are shopping yeah. malls, uh, and uh, offices are in big trouble. Shopping malls don't seem to be <laughs> at this point, even though, though the, well, mo the mall model has changed. So over time, uh, is it going to be a problem? That is that is something that the Fed does need to watch. Mike McKee, we'll have to see that. Markets, you, McKee's here, so the market deteriorates. S&P uh, down seven-tenths of a percent. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, we welcome uh, all of you here. I'm here with Michael McKee, head of all of our economic coverage. We're trying to uh, grapple here with the shock and awe of how wrong McKee has been all year, exceeded only by how wrong I've been all year. Mike, I was in the triple leverage all cash fund. That really worked out in a massive bull market. Have you ever seen so many people be so wrong as we have been from 1231-22? Well, uh, there, there are a lot of people who have been right as well. What I haven't seen is the kind of split that we've seen, uh, not just on analysts, but uh, on the Fed. For many, many years, uh, even you, you would have a dissenter here and there. And while we haven't seen significant dissents from the Fed this year, in their speeches and public comments, Fed officials are making it clear there are definitely two, maybe three camps at the Fed. Raise rates more, hold and watch, and we don't know. And that is something that we haven't seen in quite some time. And uh, you listened to Jay Powell this week, and he was kind of— um, I don't want to say wishy-washy, but he was saying the majority think that we are probably going to have to, and it, it, if the economy develops the way we think it is, that may be what we need to do. Whereas you go back to an Alan Greenspan who would say, this is what we're going to do. This is what we need to do. It's a, it's a different world. Is he a Greenspan? The answer is no. He's really looking at a majority, more of a council basis. Right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Michael McKee, thank you so much. This is wonderful. We're going to do this for another week into the third uh, quarter. That will be good. What we know is McKee's driven the markets lower. Futures at negative 33. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. As we continue to see borrowing costs rise, interest rates rise, this is going to undermine affordability and valuations. So this is a hit to the residential as well as the commercial market. But the bigger risk is that the Fed loses its resolve in the face of this weakness and allows inflation to become entrenched. 
Lindsay Pieg, the chief economist at Stiefel, she was absolutely brilliant today. They're framing out higher interest rates. She minces no words. I mean, Adam Posen gives it a theory and an economic angle. The market economist Pieg says, look, get used to it. We're going to see rates. We're going to dive into that. And the zeitgeist this weekend at Bloomberg is simple. We've had a team of our Bloomberg News experts really look at real estate. We're going to do that right now for you. The world's empty office buildings, it is a time bomb. It's a time bomb developing across the world's real estate markets. Defaults are stretching across major cities as higher interest rates and falling property values are bringing the commercial real estate market to a precipice. That's from John Gittleson and her team here. Really, really solid reporting here on some of the obvious geographies. We're going to take a different track, tact right now. And for those of you renting, for those of you looking at investment where you're scared stiff of the six months to come, someone expert on this is Brad Dillman. He's chief economist of Cortland in Atlanta. They do all sorts of Sunbelt multifamily stuff. But far, far more importantly, this is a guy out of Washington and LSE in the economics of geography and spatial economics. This is a cottage industry of the London School of Economics, and Dillman is one of their esteemed graduates. How bad is the geography of our multifamily investment right now? We use the inflammatory phrase. This is Gittleson's fault. We use the phrase time bomb. Is your world, Brad Dillman, a time bomb? I wouldn't call it a time bomb, no. Uh, and to the degree that it might be, it's a very slow-moving one. Uh, there's a number of factors at play here. Um, I've interpreted a lot of the policies coming out of the pandemic as being a de facto housing supply stimulus, not just on the single family side where we had low interest rates leading to home price appreciation and single family supply, but the eviction moratoria, distorting occupancy rates, markets, increasing rent growth, and then in the context of zero interest rates, allowing a lot of multifamily supply to, to kick off. In a country that's been underbuilt for quite some time, that's not really an issue. But could it compound into one eventually? Yes. Right. I, I'm fascinated what you see. And don't kid yourselves, guys. Cortland is looking at this like on a five-minute basis. Are you actually seeing rents level out or rent disinflation? Could that be possible? Asking for 20 million people in tri-state New York, they don't believe it. Yeah. <clears throat> no, the data is very clear that we've been in a disinflationary rent growth environment. So annual rent growth peaked. In general terms, you know, in the summer of last year, it's been slowing since then. One thing we have seen has been that new leases, so we're always looking at, you know, new leases and then also existing leases that are going to renew, right? New leases for a vacant unit have started to increase again, just at the same time that it looks like occupancies may start to trough. So what has been called like a six to eight month disinflationary environment in rent growth looks like it could actually start to re-expand again. Help me with a knot in my backyard. I mean, what, what's a typical multifamily size? How many units is a typical Cortland property? About 250, <clears throat> 250 to 300 units. These, is, you know, for Cortland, it's suburban mid-rise product, generally in the Sun Belt. But obviously, there's all sorts right. of different types of housing out there. What's the knot in my backyard level right now? Is it tough to build this stuff like it is up in the Northeast? You know, the reality is that the suburbs have never been more accommodated when it comes to multifamily housing. It's a it's a narrative that we hear a lot. If you look at the construction as a percentage of inventory in the suburbs, it's really caught up to the urban floor. I, I see you know, the problem here, folks, is Brad answers short questions. He thinks he's on TV. You're on radio, too, Brad, worldwide. So you're allowed to expand on that. I want you to expand right now on your optimism on multifamily housing over the next two years, because all we get up here in New York, all we get is gloom on real estate. I'm not hearing that love from you. Are you optimistic about multifamily development? Am I optimistic about development? No, I'm not. Uh, and the reason for that is the interest rate environment. If we look at the, the cost to get a construction loan for the larger kind of product that, say, Cortland would develop, this 250 to 300 unit product, it's too stiff right now. As far as we can tell, that area of the multifamily market has shut down. But if you look at multifamily starts in the five unit and up space, right? So this is going to be smaller product, maybe 10 units, maybe 40 units, maybe in places like Knoxville, maybe even rural America. <clears throat> this kind of product is still starting and is still underway. So July 26 and September 20 are Fed meetings. If they act, and it's 
I'm not going to say highly likely, but it is probable that they'll find a new rate regime at a higher level. What does that do to multifamily real estate and, for that matter, commercial real estate that you study across America? Right. So obviously, just by keeping financing costs high, it's going to have an impact on values. We've already seen an impact on liquidity in the space, meaning we haven't mm -hmm. seen too many transactions. It's going to make further construction a little bit more difficult and will certainly lead to some distress. Right now, it would appear that the distress is really going to be in that construction and transitional financing space maturities in the 2023 through 2025 range. If rates do say high like that, and let's say we do hit a, a new regime of saying, you know, OK, the Fed funds rate is going to be, at, you know, three or four percent, you know, in perpetuity, uh, you know, with bouts up and down. We would need to see an inflationary environment that corresponds with that. Right. So we would need to see rent growth or cheaper inputs um, into the development process in order to see development continue at pace. On Bloomberg Surveillance on radio and television, we're talking with Brad Dillman of Atlanta of Cortland, where they do multifamily housing. It's something, and I'm a, I'm really at remiss of this, folks. I, we ignore this, and it's completely a New York City conceit, and we should not. It's a huge part of a discussion in America. I want to go demographic on you right now, Brad Dillman. I'm going to be the only one left on the island of Manhattan. Everybody else is moving to Florida. Is that a cliche, or is there something actually true that we all got to move down to Atlanta Braves baseball? <laughs> you know, it certainly seems like everybody's moving to Florida sometimes. Uh, the reality is, too, when we look at some of this information, we're seeing that the migration to the Sun Belt has actually slowed a little bit. We look at cell phone data. We look at the censuses. My, uh, you know, population and components of change tables. It's still there. People are still moving, but it has slowed down a bit. Something that we don't talk about that we don't hear a lot about is immigration. Now, immigration has actually kicked off very strongly uh, over the last few years, really coming out of the pandemic. If you look at the uh, foreign-born adult population, it's increased nearly 5 million people in three years. Right, That's bigger than the population of New Zealand. It's bigger than the population of whole states like Oregon in 2020. This is a story for gateway markets. And what are new gateway markets, places like Atlanta and Front Range, which are probably seeing, as best we can tell, more immigration <clears throat> right. proportionally than they would have historically. But this is a – I mean, everyone, Brad, in New York City of every walk of life is talking about this, the extraordinary expense of some of our major urban areas. And there's other th issues, crime and that. I, I get it. But there's this huge study of what our kids are doing. Does Cortland have research that would have vengeance the younger crew – they just simply can't afford it, and they're moving down to a Cortland multifamily to rebuild their lives. I, I don't know about that as far as people moving interstate. Uh, one thing that we have seen in our own data has been that we have been a beneficiary of people moving interstate, but whether or not these are people are choosing to do that in the sense that they have to do it, right, because of their own personal right. affordability situation, not something we have clarity on. We do know that the general narratives that people are kind of bumping down the urban hierarchy because of cost of living reasons. Brad, thank you so much. Generous of your time. Brad Dillman of Cortland, uh, early morning in Atlanta here on something that, and I, folks, this is completely my fault. We don't cover municipal bonds. We give short shrift to multifamily housing, which is dumb, dumb, dumb. And, you know, there's some other things we don't look at here within the economic and finance investment stew that we really should. Brad Dillman there with a clinic on multifamily housing. And the major message to me there is he confirms what we're hearing from Lindsay Piegza and from uh, Neela Richardson and others, we are seeing rent disinflation across this country. I can assure you that no one in Manhattan and the five boroughs of New York City is considering rent uh, disinflation. In the market, a deterioration of the tape, there's no other way to put it, and this is front and center into this Friday morning. It's a recession watch worldwide. The launch pad on the Bloomberg has changed. Futures negative 35. The VIX, <coughs> I give up. I, I got to see Dean Kernett for cocktails tonight to figure this out. 13.76 on the VIX. I don't get it. Oil under $70 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate, $68.26. Uh, a 10-year yield, 3.71%. In abruptly nine basis points. That's a substantial uh, move. Again, on recession watch, dollars stronger. On a fractional basis, the only thing not down is Bitcoin at 30000 On Wall Street Week this evening, it is Romaine Bostic looking for Celtic season tickets with Romaine Bostic. Steve Pagliuca of the Boston Celtics. And this is Must Listen Tonight, Rushir Sharma, the Rockefeller Inst International. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.